Five, we will call ourselves to order. This is the meeting of the Situate Planning Board, August 9th, the year 2012. Um, looking for a motion to accept the agenda. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. First item on the agenda is request to eliminate special <coughs> permit condition limiting the number of signs for the Jacob Hatch building on 10 new driftway. And before I turn it over to you, Joe, let me make the announcement that um, I am a member of the uh, board of directors of the Knights of Columbus, which is going to direct the butter to this piece of property. But I have no financial interest in to the extent that anybody has a concern about my ability to, to address this squarely and fairly. Let me know. Hearing none, I will participate in the hearing, which will give you the opportunity to get a supermajority. Having said all of that, the floor is yours. Introduce yourself. Great. Uh, Talk about what you want to do. My name is Joe Scanzillo, and this is Russ Anderson. We represent the owners of the Jacob Hatch building. And um, some nine, oh, nearly nine years ago, we came before the planning board in the uh, permitting process to get permits so that we could go, go forward and build a building. In March of 2000, the uh, planning board approved our special permit application. And one of the conditions in that special permit application uh, it, the, that condition number eight is the condition that we would like to eliminate from the special permit. That condition is pretty simple. It just says that no more than one freestanding sign identifying the building, not larger than 18 inches by six feet, which is nine square feet, uh, as described in, in, our, in our blueprints um, in, our, in a letter that was further describing it will be basically allowed on the property. That pretty much, having said that, that pretty much limits us and puts us at a substantial uh, difference with uh, just about every, as far as I know, perhaps even every other property or in the town in that um, we are substantially below the uh, requirements and parameters of the zoning assigned by law in, uh, for the town, uh, which states that uh, ver you know, commercial and business enterprises can have signs up to 100 square feet and so on and so forth. It's not, it's not our interest, uh, nor is it our motive to have a bunch of signs on the property. Um, I, I'm assuming that most of you folks know where the Jacob Hatch building is at the roundabout. You can probably tell that, that the um, architecture and the real estate and the maintenance of the property is pretty subtle, pretty subdued, and the mindset of the owners is pretty low key. Uh, so it's not that we want to go out and have big flashing type signs. We just want to be treated like basically everybody else in town is. Uh, by eliminating that provision, we just basically can follow the zoning, the bylaw, the sign bylaw like everybody else. And that's fundamentally what uh, what we're requ we, we are requesting from the planning board here tonight, just to be treated like everyone else. Okay, thank you, Laura. Um, I I think everybody you know appreciates the building and admires the building and the sign that they have is this beautiful. It's granite, isn't it? Oh, it's granite posts. Granite posts. Right. Well, it's on a hand carved sign. It's got sign. a beautiful old fashioned look to it. Oh, you can find them. Okay, um, it's got a beautiful old fashioned look to it, but. Um, the only things that I think um, the board might want to concern themselves with are that the picture that you showed looks color coordinated, you know, it's using kind of a golden brown and a dark brown color. Yeah. And I think maybe as long as you're willing to do that, maybe the board can kind of write that in as one of the conditions. Uh, well, because it's so much more attractive looking that way. Yeah, we and wanted I think it's to a, like a benefit to the building as well as definitely to the, to the ta appearance of the town. It's such a visible location on the rotary. That would be one of the suggestions that I would have. Um, the other one would be, I, I agree this is smaller than what the zoning bylaw allows, but no business really has a hundred square foot sign. I mean, it would just be. It would be like really overwhelming if, if anybody did have that. So thank goodness everybody is, is cooperating with that. Some businesses do seem to have signs that do not quite comply with the exact letter of the law of the zoning bylaw. You go through the harbor, there are a lot of um, extra signs um, in terms of you know all sorts of situations. So I think it's not a bad idea to say that 
you know, there's, you know, there's going to be this one sign or no more than two signs or, you know, just to reiterate what the zoning bylaw says. That's my personal, you know, you know, professional recommendation. If I might, the, the, um, uh, and fundamentally I agree with pretty much everything you said, the, um, the purpose of the sign zoning bylaw as described in the zoning bylaws is to protect public health and safety, uh, to reduce traffic hazards. In so far, I believe having a sign identifying the building will do both of those things at the location where it's visible from the roundabout. Promote and protect aesthetic value of, of, in nature of the town. Well, if we're going to do something that's similar in flavor, which is why you have that particular rendering there, it's, it's an example. It's not necessarily exactly what we want to do, but it may end up being exactly what we do. Um, you can see what type of architecture we, we favor for the property. And uh, to promote economic development, uh, the, the note that I sent around indicates that that particular sign that you're looking at is 56 square feet. That sign, actually the backer board is 56 square feet. That sign is made up of three smaller signs. Each one is about two feet by eight feet. The, the sign at the top identifies the Jacob Hatch building and its address. The middle sign, which is another two foot by eight foot section, when there is property for lease on, the, uh, when there's space for lease in the building, that sign would be up. When there's not space for lease in the building, that sign would not be there. And the bottom sign, that just happens to be Little Steps Learning Center, could be the same for, would be an interchangeable sign promoting a new business that's coming to town, that's, that's uh, occupying our real estate, or a current business such as Citra Pediatrics or, or, or uh, Citra Podiatry or Maureen Hurley's attorney office and so on, um, that would be interchangeable on the bottom. But the basic, the essence of that particular design shows 56 square feet, three separate signs in a flavor that's consistent with the sign that we have that Laura was describing earlier. I could too. We, we operate as a condominium association and while Joe and I have some of the units, we also have other owners there, Citra Pediatrics being mentioned, Citra Podiatry. And almost since we opened the building back in, I think, say, 2004, uh, their clients have had some difficulty, particularly new clients, in finding the building, finding how to get into the building. Uh, it is somewhat hidden, particularly in the summer, as, a, as some of the uh, brush grows in. So it's been a, it's been a, you know, pretty regular refrain on the part of uh, those people, particularly those with, with multiple clients, to try to make the signage somewhat more accessible for their clients. Um, recognizing the, the, the sign that Laura mentioned is very nice, but you really have to be in there to see it. No, no one is going to see that from the street. I have a question. Um, this existing sign, it's there right now? Yes. Like I moved here in 2006, and as far as I know, it's been there that entire time. It has. So can you can give me a little background about if there's only one sign allowed, how did this appear? Uh, Why that has it been there for so long? That sign actually was the uh, mea culpa. That, uh, <laughs> that, that sign actually was, uh, uh, when we were under construction, the original sign was that, that big, and it showed the architect and the engineers right. and so on and so forth. So underneath all of that stuff, and actually the four, the four lease part of that sign uh, used to say for sale or lease when we were actually it selling office for lease right now. Yeah, but it used to say for sale or lease, but that was revised. Um, but uh, effectively, those posts in that sign backer have effectively been there since the beginning, since the beginning of construction. A long time ago. We yeah. have to make it legal and uh, <laughs> it, it needs it. So, to so the I just wanted to, to clarify because this was something that I wasn't sure of. Are you proposing to take this down and replace it with the sign, or yes. are you proposing an additional sign no. with this? <laughs> no, just to no, clarify, no. we are uh, to be clear on that. We are proposing to take that sign down to substitute uh, the sign that you have before you, the other right, sign, right, and the move it a little bit further back on the property, away from away from the fence. Would it be about the same height? Uh, no, it actually um, it actually would probably be a little bit lower. Uh, our the sign that you have before you here is 84 inches and I think that sign is 96 so it's about be about a foot shorter um, be about I think maybe even be more than a foot might be even be two feet shorter than what you've got here um, is there have you looked at any other potential 
locations than right there. I'm just curious, just because I know it is very visually uh, apparent from the uh, rotary, which I guess yeah. that's, I know what you're, that's what you're looking for, but maybe something that wouldn't be quite there on the rotary, but a little. Well, the problem we're having, the problem we've been having for a long time is that since the roundabouts come in, and even when it was just a simple intersection, people would always say, well, I get to this intersection and I don't know what to do. Or, and since the roundabout's been there, it's just, I get to the road roundabout and I don't know where you guys are. So the whole focus, or almost all of the focus is that of the criticism that we've been receiving and the complaints we've been receiving, and it is a, I really believe it's a threat to public safety, is focused around the, the location of that intersection. So it would almost be counterproductive to put that someplace else because people would still be lost like they have been for the past eight years. You just go around again. Yeah, right. <laughs> but they, they still wouldn't see the sign. I <laughs> yeah, I, we don't think it would be as effective uh, at the entrance to the building. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Or it's not relatively narrow there. There's a lot of vegetation, which... Um, or I was even thinking, me. like, where it is now is kind of at an, like the angle, like I said, almost right at the rotary, if it could be, like, if you're looking at this sign oops, here, like, a little bit more to the right. But I don't know if that would be possible or if that would be out of the line. Like, where this is now, like, if you just move yeah. it over to the I, right. I think in front of that, there are a number of large trees, trees that are right actually on town property. So to slide it too far one way or the other, you're going to put it behind one of the large trees. I, yeah. Okay. Maples, I think I'm not sure. Yeah, th right. there, there are some trees on our property that are either dead or dying in some scrub stuff that will be cleared out there. But fundamentally, we, we can't we can't touch any of the town's trees in, in so we have to position accordingly. Okay. Well, I just, again, I was just uh, asking that more for see if you had done like studies about other locations, if that would be good for line of sight, or if that was the premier best location. It, it actually is, but set back a little bit further from from the fence a little bit. Um, uh, this has been bantered about for a few years by by the the people who own the property, and uh, nobody wants to change the location because when uh, when elderly patients from Citroen Podiatry come in, they say, well, I go around the rotary and I see something, but it doesn't tell me what the name of the building is. So, um, it's pretty much, I, I think we have to stay in that general location, just set back a little bit. Okay. I don't have any further questions. Yes. Um, I, I think my preference would be versus deleting the condition to actually approve something new because I feel like then we know what's gonna happen there. I don't like surprises and there is a special permit condition now, so they've presented a design. Um, I'm wondering if this might be something to go before the design review committee possibly. It sounds like there's some questions about the location of it and everything, um, but that would be my strong preference to actually change the condition to say we approve this new sign. It's such a visible location and um, I, I can sympathize with you saying, you know, you want to be treated just like everybody else, but this is a very visible location and, you know, the design of the building's great. You know, it's a very nice looking building for Situate and everything, but I'd hate to make a mistake on this and just kind of leave it open and then something pops up and people say, how did that get approved? I mean, it, you have gone through the footwork to do a design and everything and it'd be nice for us just to say, you can do this, let's bless it and you're on your way and yeah. no one has to wonder what's going to happen down the road so that's more a note to the rest of the board I guess yeah. but I, I have a little bit a few questions about the location and materials and you're mentioning like the height of it and things like that and I'd rather see that pinned down now I don't know if it it's in the plan but I'd, I'd rather approve something very specific hmm. um, I mean I, I don't mind the proposal I think it looks it looks nice and you know it's, yeah. I mean, I prefer this over the current sign. Well, exactly. The, yeah, the yeah. current, not allowed sign. But it's <laughs> <laughs> that's, and that's a lot more helpful to the to public safety and direction right. um, than what's there now. But it is pretty visible, so when and it clearly goes up, I, so. I can understand your position, and um, I would hope that you can understand ours. Like that, we would prefer to have, of course, something that is just written exactly as anyone else uh, would have. Uh, without any special conditions. And I will just only add this. Uh, you're all very familiar with the building, and you know many of the things that are there were part of the original plan and, and certainly were, were approved. Uh, but every decision that Joe and I had to make during the construction and, and thereafter were made with the idea of keeping the character of the building uh, consistent. I mean, 
you know, it's in our best interest to have signage and plantings and mm -hmm. and paint schemes, et cetera, right. you know, consistent with the appearance of the building because you know, that's, it's important to us too. One of the things Russ is alluding to is um, the fact that we pretty much don't spare any expense for the building. Mm -hmm. um, for example, conservation, we were required to put in 210 plants. We put in well over 600 uh, as a matter of example. To, to go to your to your point, if, if you approve something specific without changing, without eliminating this special condition. Well, we would, we'd replace it with a new condition. But then you would probably have to add a long list of other things that I know this condition doesn't mean. For example, safety signs, handicap parking signs, directional signs, so on and so forth. Things that, if you read this condition the way it's written, we can't even have handicap parking signs. Oh, so you're talking about much more than just this sign? We, yeah, I mean, it, yeah. technically, we're not supposed to have handicap parking signs according to this condition. Okay. Well, we could write uh, that in. I mean, I well, the zoning bylaw, of course, allows that yeah. in addition to any kind of advertising sign. Yeah. I, well, that's what we want to do. We want to be. We want to go in conformity with the zoning bylaw. That's our. That's our goal. I, I guess my comment. I mean, it sounds like you've done a nice job, and I'm not questioning <coughs> you know, your, you know, background or your um, intent to do that and everything. But I'm a strong believer, and well, let's just put it in writing, and then everybody knows we're all on the same page, and there's no surprises. So. That would be my preference. And if we do need to address those other things, we should address them. How do we know that, that we're going to get all of them? Um, we'll, we can certainly take our best guess and remember what we think we're supposed to put in a revised condition. But what if we miss something? Come back again? Or? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Well, yeah. I have the same sort of concern. I mean, as I read the zoning bylaw, <coughs> you could actually have two signs, each each 100 square feet. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of signage yeah. in a very prominent location, which I don't think would do do the town any favors in terms of uh, visual uh, impact. And I know that that's not your intent, but I'm inclined to say the same thing. Um, 94. I really would ra rather rewrite the condition Certainly it was put in there for a good reason in the first place, um, probably with something like this situation in mind, not allowing the sort of wholesale um, use of a lot of sign, signage area. Um, so I guess I guess I, I stand in that same posi position as you do. And it sounds like we're pretty close to it. They have a design and you know, it sounds like you know what you want. So if we can just put a little bit more detail on it, we can and get I there pretty we quickly. We could certainly write in the rest of this, which is yeah. public safety, directional, obviously barrier-free access is a, is a building code requirement. You have to have those signs. So. And Laura's that excellent kind of at thing. writing conditions, so <laughs> I, I don't think we'll miss anything. I don't think it's that complicated, but it is just, you know, so we're all on the same page and, you know, we know what we're getting. And I don't know. I think she wrote Condition 8 in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> well, she did a good job. You're back, right? <laughs> she just <laughs> missed us, I'm sure. Yeah. Eric? Uh, um, <coughs> uh, Mr. Monger, uh, I believe suggests that this is a, an appropriate thing to put in front of the design review committee, uh, and, and I, I concur. Um, we've had a, um, one of your neighbors across the way recently had a, an issue that came before us, and we frankly didn't like what they did. Uh, and we, we sent them back to the design review committee people to, to try and ameliorate the problem. And, uh, and the result that came out was, was pretty good, at least in, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I think that, uh, that what they came away with after the input from design review was a superior alternative. Um, and I think that uh, to your advantage would be to go to design review, get the input of, of stellar professional people who are donating their time to the town. Uh, and I think that, uh, that there's every reason to expect that uh, they will assist you in coming up with a, a, a really good um, proposal for this, which we will be inclined to approve. Uh, and, uh, and rather than trying to, to fix something that, that may not work real well, let's do it right the first time. 
Um, and so that, those are my thoughts. Well, for doing it right the first time. Um, the, is there something about that sign design that you have before you that, that is not appealing or that you don't like? We just don't want to become a victims of the law of unintended consequences. Yeah, let, let me chip on. I, I understand where you guys are coming from, at least Dan and Eric, but my concern is I think I'm holding them to a different standard than I am anybody else that would get approval with a special mm -hmm. permit. Uh, and, uh, and, yeah. And I guess, and, and I, I'm not dissatisfied with the, the, the proposal the, you know, the big type of signs you're looking to do, and nor am I concerned about the location on it. It's just that I think that I'm, I'm bringing you into a holding you to a different standard, not only with condition eight, but two, if I come back up and I modify condition eight, then I'm still holding you to a different standard. Uh, my approach would be to come back up and, and basically take condition eight and say, look, you're going to remove the existing construction sign, and that the, you'd then be required to be compliant to the sign, sign bylaw. So that way they would hold. I think that's the wrong way to go about it, but it's. But if it, I, just to, if they were constructing this building from scratch, or maybe you can give us a background of why that condition was put there in the first place. What was the? Do you remember? I know that's terrible. Uh, I'm sorry uh, well, to no, put you on was, the spot. It was a long time ago, and um, I think we were all working very hard on that proposal. Mm -hmm. It was a big, massive building. At least it seemed that way at the time. And I think there might have been a feeling with such a big building, maybe the needs need for signs wasn't quite as pressing as otherwise. It was a different economy. I mean, there were a lot of a lot of things that changed in the in the meantime. I can see now definitely there's a need for a sign with with any office building, any business, and I'm not sure that I would make the same decision again. But that's not to say that you know that I wouldn't um, want to have, you know, the board have, have some control over it. I mean, that's just my, you know, my, you know, gut feeling on it. But it, the, the sign that's there, it's a, it's a really beautiful sign also, you know, I think yeah. you, you have to say, um, okay. with the granite. Oh, and the, the, and the, the Jacob Hatch wood, building, it's, yeah. It's a, it's a very good looking sign. Mm -hmm. Back in those days, everybody was very busy. The town hall, the town hall was just swamped short-handed and swamped. And not, I don't know if that's probably still the case right now, even though the economic climate is somewhat different. And um, there's a lot more going on and a lot more concern about a big property uh, developer coming into town, even though we've been here for a long time, uh, and, and making a mess of a piece of property. I think that's what, where Laura was, what, what she was referring to earlier. But that's not the case, as we've proven over the past decade. Um, and uh, like I said, we would prefer just to be held to the same standard as everyone else, knowing who we are and knowing what we do as a matter of routine and as a matter of principle. We're not people who say one thing and do another. We've never been that, ever. And for example, with the old house that, that was there, we said that if, if it was possible to save the old house, we would. And in fact, we did do that at a cost of well over three or four hundred thousand dollars more than we had to do it. But we did do it because we said we would do it. So you know, I know you know you can't take you can't take a handshake as a guarantee, but that's pretty much the way we feel that we've operated since the beginning. I, I would just remind the board that you know, with the Ice House when they came through. We viewed that as, you know, the entry to Situate and the level of scrutiny that that went through. Um, you know, having this go to design review wouldn't be treating them differently. And every special permit is a discretionary permit. So um, you don't come in and get a special permit and just automatically get the signage. It's a whole design consideration. That's why you have a special permit to take in the unique factors. So um, I take exception with, you know, your comment that that would be treating them differently. It's not. Every special permit's unique and. I think that, you know, based on all the conversations we had regarding the Ice House and the importance of that entry to Situate, this is even more visible 
on the rotary. I, I just think uh, we'd be doing a big disservice not to spend the time to understand what we're getting and make sure that it's the best design possible. I, you know, I don't have a problem with consulting with design folks because we we appreciate them and we use them all the time. Not not necessarily this design review people, but architects and designers. They they do add a lot of value to it, the things that we do daily. I would not have a problem with, with that. It's just that eliminating the condition is what we're trying to do. To make uh, part of our design uh, something that we would review and go together forward with, with the design review people, I, I wouldn't have a problem with that because I'm sure they're reasonably intelligent people. Well, that would be the idea is that we would then replace the condition with here's your new signage and you know, and give you the other stuff you're talking about, you know, that should have Good. been in there anyway, the handicap signage and the directional Good. and all that. Could that sounds like that was kind of probably know, an oversight. That's that's okay. supposed to be in there. I think a lot of that's just, uh, you know, regular zoning laws. And I think what, what Joe said and what I was going to say as well is it's, it's that article that we feel is treating us differently. We have no objection to having our proposed sign, you know, reviewed and approved mm. yeah. and even input from others. It's, you know, it's no intention of doing so. Could that be the condition? per se, like we hold them to the same standards as everyone else based on these zoning bylaws, but then for any sign that they erect, you know, they have to get approval from the design review committee? No, I mean, I think what we would do is you'd, you'd basically modify the condition to say that, you know, all of this applies to them just like everybody else except for with respect to the big sign, you know what I mean? We'd have to go through it piece by piece, but... Um, we have to approve what the design committee reviews. They don't have approval authority. Well, so it goes to them, and then we have to sign off on it. We can't have so their their advisory. To their us advisory, yeah. Us. So we can't yeah. we can't draft it that way. But we can basically say, you know, uh, with regard to you know the handicap signage, the directional signage, you know, the things we'll have to go through it and see. They get a free pass on that. But with the big, you know, the big sign, here's what we're approving. This is all you get. Laura, can I ask if this was approved originally under 710.3 or 710.4? Uh, it was a site plan special permit. Is that answer? So what, what, what provision of the signage bylaw applies to it? Um, it was, the, the condition about the sign was outside of the sign bylaw. I mean, it was more restrictive than what's in the sign bylaw. And I think th the reason why. Well, was no, I, I, I'm, that's, that's, a, that's a different point from what I was trying to get at. There's two sections here. One talks about signs by right, basically, in business and commercial districts. The other one talks about signs in business and commercial districts by special permit. Well, the special permit is only by the Board of Appeals, so, so it that's definitely not have that's that not what we're talking. So about. it was seven ten point three. Then they, yeah. they, okay, fine. Because I, it, you know, all due respect, gentlemen, I absolutely appreciate the integrity that you've shown in the in the architecture of the building and how you developed that site, and I understand your position. But what we're being shown here is a 56 foot square a 56 square foot sign um, and we're being asked to approve that uh, as the first increment I believe of something that could be as much as 200 square feet if we simply abolish the special condition and revert to the signage bylaw you have the right to put 200 square feet of signage up um, uh, for that building and I could certainly see the utility of that because you've got a multiple a tenant situation and perhaps every attorney perhaps every law, uh, doctor and every other business that's within that building would like its own board I'm sure I would if I were an architect in that in that building uh, and I don't think that this uh, represents uh, reasonably uh, what is very likely to happen perhaps not even under your ownership perhaps under a subsequent ownership I think we can almost bank on 200 square feet of signage if we don't, you know, do some make some other ruling that uh, that allows it to go the other way. Let me, because we're we're running late, so let me come back and see if I summarize what I think we've got. One is is that I think the feeling, at least of the board, is that, that there will be no straight. The board wouldn't support a straight elimination of Condition Eight. What the board would support as I understand it would be a, a, a variation of the existing uh, condition 8 which would define 
the necessary signage, the, the handicap access to safety, those sort of things, uh, as well as a single sign that would be replacing the construction sign that currently exists. Is that mm -hmm. what the board? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds right. Mm -hmm. Now, given that, I think um, we need to figure out, one is to come back up, I guess we need to formalize that in a vote. And then secondly, we've got to come back and figure out what the process is for uh, modifying the condition eight. Right. Well, I think the steps one, we have to decide whether we want, want to refer this to design review. I mean, clearly this is going to take a second hearing, so if that's the path we want to go, we would refer them to design review, see what they come up with, and then in the meantime draft a proposed condition and come up at a subsequent hearing. So that's, I think that's the first question is whether we want to refer them to design review. I, I think that is the appropriate thing, so I, I'd go ahead and make that motion that we refer okay, let's the do primary sign. Uh, second for the motion. Review. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. You get step one. I guess step two is that we would continue this to our next hearing and we would, during that time, you well, know, come I up with it. I think it's a discussion rather than a hearing. I think, yeah, if that's what it is, that we just continue this to the next next meeting. Or until we have design reviews comments before us. Yeah, we'd have to coordinate, make sure. Um, how often do they meet? They meet about once a month. Um, I mean, I can sometimes get them in in like a week to ten days, but you know, not not all the time. I mean, they, they're only three people, and they've got um, at least one of them travels quite a bit. So I think within the next two weeks, we're probably pretty good. But I don't think we could necessarily get this on the next planning board agenda. Are you up against any time frames for a tenant or anything like no. that on it? No. Okay. No, not really. Other than the little steps as having an open enrollment. Uh, period right now, and <coughs> they want to feel comfortable that if they put a sign up, there wouldn't be a problem. But I, I'm I'm not sure that they're allowed, as a matter of right, to put a sign on the on the building, not a freestanding sign or not. I'd have to investigate that. Well, they okay. they've got the sign that's there now. That, yeah, that right. big sign is still there now, and I don't think anyone's talking about and that going anywhere. Action. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's just get it done as quickly as we can, so if we can get design review to meet and and then maybe. Get you on our agenda and okay, so what you, two meetings well, maybe you contact with meeting. design review. Oh yeah, and yeah contact yeah. with Joe and it'll work out. Yeah. Okay. And then the next meeting, if you want to continue the discussion or maybe you don't, you're saying <coughs> you don't want to take a vote on that. I don't think we need put to. Put it I on mean, for September 13th. We'll come back up and once you've got a, a time with design review, we'll put you on the next meeting. Good. Okay, does that work? Good. Okay. Good. Uh, thank you for your comments. They're okay. well taken and uh, very good comments. And we'll move forward. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. It's now a few minutes after 8. The next item on the agenda is a continued public hearing for accessory dwellings special permit on 33 Garden Road. We have the applicant. <laughs> Reintroduce yourself. Yeah. Just, just for sure. the record, we opened up this hearing uh, at our previous meeting, but we because we did not have the availability of the five full member voting board it's been continued to tonight and this is a special permit requiring a super majority fine with me sir thank you very much my name is John Townsend I'm with St. Catholic Group and I'm here on behalf of Maria Marcelino in regards to uh, the proposed accessory dwelling at 33 Garden Road um, the plan, uh, you do have the packet, and I believe, in plans uh, in front of you. The uh, existing building is uh, measured to the outside of the perimeter walls, approximately uh, 1,090 square feet, by my surveyor's estimation. Um, the proposed building, um, accessory dwelling, measured the same way from the outside of the perimeter walls. It'd be uh, 745.6 square feet. That's a uh, uh, 31.5 or 31 feet 6 inches by uh, 23 feet 8 inches. The, um, you have, I believe, in your packet an affidavit confirming that the uh, owner of the property will occupy the property. Um, the existing parking shown on the site plan on the right hand side of the existing structure will remain. Um, that 
uh, driveway area, not including the garage, is 83 feet long. Uh, it's 12 feet wide at the uh, where it intersects the street. It's about eight feet wide at its uh, narrowest point, uh, average of about 10 feet wide. Um, the new parking for the accessory dwelling, shown directly to the right and in front, you know, the front and right of the proposed structure, is 46 feet long uh, by 12 feet wide. That allows for the parking of uh, about three or four cars, three cars probably in the uh, proposed driveway and uh, approximately four uh, straight in in the existing. Um, the existing home is three bedrooms, one bath. The accessory dwelling, as you see in the layout there, is two bedrooms, one bath. Uh, the property is on town sewer. The utilities will be separated uh, to each of these structures. The proposal has been discussed with the Board of Health, the Conservation Department, Building Department, DPW, uh, Water and Sewer, with um, uh, no, no negative response from any of them. There's no um, conservation uh, wetlands in the area to be concerned with. The Board of Health is obviously uh, fine with the sewer connection, uh, the DPW. <coughs> um, I believe that the uh, property, the proposal meets the purpose and criteria of uh, section 530.1 and 530.2. Um, and I do want to just make sure that I have, um, I think we would mention we're running a little late and there's um, some public discussion. I want to make sure I have uh, opportunity to respond to any questions or comments that come up. What we'll do is when you have your, complete your presentation, we'll then hear from the town planner. If the questions in the board, then we we'll open up to the public. And then, the, then the board will go we'll from there. So, I mean, you'll have plenty of opportunity to address the, the questions as they arise. Wonderful. But they'll, right. go, they'll go through the chair. Um, I was speaking with Laura or, earlier in the week. Uh, the, um, she wanted me to uh, clarify the uh, uh, occupancy plans of the site. <coughs> um, and uh, as Maria had stated in the affidavit, she plans on occupying the site. Um, time the uh, her plan is to occupy the uh, if approved the proposed accessory dwelling uh, as soon as a certificate of occupancy is issued by the building department at which time she would remodel the um, existing dwelling uh, because it's a, a little larger obviously and um, a little uh, better for raising a small family she has two young children the existing tenants in that uh, in the structure of 33 Garden Road currently have been notified that they're going to need to uh, find alternate housing. Um, you know, in preparation for the, should this uh, proposal be approved. Um, and the, um, unfortunately, Maria Marcelino's mother is uh, has Alzheimer's disease. She's uh, doing very well at the moment. This, what this proposal does for Maria is it gives her an opportunity uh, to occupy the space and at some point in the future when the, um, can, if the condition, or when the condition progresses, the mother and father would have uh, an opportunity to occupy the uh, accessory dwelling structure there on the left. In the meantime, um, she could use it as a, uh, her thought is that she could use it as a rental property and the proposed accessory dwelling. Um, the, um, I just want to make sure I explain that clearly, is it, um, there'll be, there'll be questions, but I uh, just want to make sure I, I do explain that clearly for everyone. Um, the proposal itself meets all the required, dimensionally meets all the regulations of the zoning bylaw as far as setback, and coverage, and open space. Parking. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Laura? Um, as you know, the um, accessory, the yeah, accessory dwelling is a um, is is uh, something that can be approved by a special permit um, from the planning board. There really are not many requirements for it. 
Um, it can't be any greater than 750 square feet or 40% of the primary dwelling. So in this case, 750 square feet is, is what's allowed and it seems to fall within that um, within that size range, I believe it's 746 square feet. The, um, the property owner has to provide parking and there's a driveway, you know, it looks like there's going to be plenty of parking. Um, and the applicant has to, the owner has to live on the property. And um, although it's, um, you know, I suppose um, not completely clear whether she's living there right now, she intends to live there with her family and that's um, that's all the bylaw really requires. Um, so um, that being said, um, you know, I think this is a, a, it's a relatively new development that accessory dwellings can be on, you know, independent of single family houses in this zoning district. When that was originally thought of, it was for the uh, R2 and R1 zoning districts, but the bylaw was changed in 2010, and now this is something that um, anyone can do in, you know, in any location um, where there's room to to have, you know, a separate dwelling. So, um, you know, I think it's um, it's uh, something that. You know, you can look at from the standpoint that throughout Sand Hills there are a lot of homes on less than 10,000 square feet of land area, um, and um, you know whether uh, you know whether you know you, you, you the, the the town is kind of in a um, it's like a split um, personality situation where the zoning says 10,000 square feet per unit, but the accessory dwelling right now really um, doesn't say that. It says you can have a separate structure in order to provide for some of the housing needs of the town, um, regardless of what your lot size is, as long as you meet the setbacks. And it does appear that this house meets the setbacks. So um, on the face of it, um, it looks like it would probably comply with, with the bylaw. But you know that being said, you know that not to you know jump ahead of you know whatever the public is here to bring out or you know whatever other issues might you know come through the public hearing. I think you know you certainly have to keep an open mind and see what you <coughs> hear and see what you feel like at the end. Oh, uh, I guess I don't have any really specific questions other than I was just curious why there was the bulkhead going down to the basement. That seemed kind of odd, Excuse like the stairway. Speak up. They're having trouble hearing. Can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. There's in the. Are we on? Mic'd? Are we? Should we be amplified? Or I don't know. Is that better? Is that better? <laughs> well, the green lights are on. Green lights on, but I don't know <laughs> what that means. Push. Oh, the, the mics basically go onto the cable. They, they, they're not the amplified the speaking here. Uh, we'll just try to speak louder. <laughs> so in the, the accessory dwelling unit plan, there was an outside entrance down to the basement, I believe. Did I see that correctly? Yes. So I was just curious why that was an outside entrance. I mean, it has well, there's really also an inside entrance. Oh, was there? There okay. are stairs that go this down. This is from memory, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's just, there's a set of stairs on the inside of, um, that you see in the layout plan heading down and the bulkhead is obviously very helpful for um, you know, gardening equipment and things so you have to drag it through the house. And okay. We're, we're, yeah, right adjacent to the, uh, to the foyer coming in. All right. Yeah. Um, the other than, I mean, that's really, I mean, the only questions I had really, like, we can't really control the architecture per se, just the setbacks and so forth, so. Oh, and the other question you, uh, I think you answered it was the fact of until this, the, her mother potentially would live there, she would, she looks at renting that out? Until such time that the, that the mother's condition would require her to, you know, have a little more attention from her daughter, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So 
just to clarify, we're <coughs> under a special permit procedure, right? This is a special permit accessory dwelling that we're under? Okay. So um, just to put a point on it, it is, it is a discretionary permit, so we do have the ability, regardless of whether it meets the specific things in the accessory bylaw, to put conditions on it and use our discretion in approving this or not approving it. So it's not strictly just you know, they meet the square footage and they get it. So not I just want to, right. just so everybody's clear on that. Correct. Um, you know, my concern with it, just looking at it, when I first looked at it, I, I thought, you know, compared to a lot of the accessory dwellings we've seen, um, usually the house footprint looks substantially bigger just from a plan standpoint compared to the accessory dwelling. Usually it, it seems to be noticeably smaller when I look at this at least the footprint anyway it's almost the same size as the existing house which causes me some concern um, one of the one of the provisions in the accessory dwelling bylaw talks about how um, the accessory dwelling shall be clearly a subordinate part of the single-family dwelling um, you know I think the intent there's somewhat of a visual intent there too that this isn't meant to be a way to get a second house on a small lot. So I'm a little bit concerned about that and setting the precedent. Um, I used to live in Sand Hills and you know, a lot of the houses that are there now already seem kind of cramped on the lots they're already on. So um, I am a little concerned about this one more than, I think it's a little different than most of the ones that we've seen in the past. And you know, I, I think we do need to consider the precedent the sets and it is a discretionary permit um, you know just glancing at the plan from what I can tell I mean I think I would drive by this lot with these two houses on there and think it's just a two five thousand square foot lots you know it wouldn't appear to be accessory to me it would it, it looks like a lot of the houses that are there now so I'm a little concerned I'm on the fence I want to hear what everybody else thinks about it but I'm it does give me some pause this application. Can I clarify? Uh, oh, sure. Let, let's finish the board and then. Oh, okay. I just want to respond specifically. Robert? Uh, certainly under 530.2D, uh, it seems to me this complies with that. I know it, uh, I know what we're talking about when we say it's uh, very similar in size to the existing building, and that is a little bit different than what we usually see, but. I don't think I can fault it for that necessarily. I think it's very significant that this is a double lot and that even though you may visually now see once this is constructed two homes on on this piece of land, uh, it's going to be not any different than the situation of the home next door to it, the situation of the home behind it, the situation of many homes along uh, along the roads that uh, that make up this area. Uh, it's not as though we were trying to uh, take a uh, a 5,000 square foot lot and put an accessory dwelling on it. That I would find, even if even if somehow the setbacks could be met, I'd find that objectionable. Um, I I can't fault this from a planning point of view. I really can't. I would echo uh, the previous statements. I have nothing more. Just an echo. Just an echo. Okay. <laughs> I guess I guess I come down and, and I get the same concerns that Dan does. I think that uh, particularly 532.f is, is I don't see it as a subordinate part of it. Um, what I really see is in my own mind basically creating a, a, a 5,000 square foot lot with putting another house on it. So in effect, that's what it would look like. That's what it would act like um, on it. And, and and I guess I'm concerned that if, let me step back. If, if I had a situation where I had the two buildings already on the lot, one of which was to become a primary residence and the other was to become an accessory resident, accessory to it, then I guess I'd be more understanding. But in effect, what I'm doing now is putting the house down and I'm creating, in my own mind, I'm creating a 5,000 square foot lot with a house on it. Um, and I think that's a greater density than what I've got elsewhere in the neighborhood for the, for the similar type lots uh, on it. So I guess that's where I come down. Tool. 
let's address the comments of the board and then we'll open up to the public. Sure. <laughs> Maybe one more comment following up on yours, but I, I guess right now the the lot size requirement, am I correct? It's 10,000 now everywhere, but the Sand Hills 5,000 lots are grandfathered. They're grandfathered. And so going forward, you know, there are no more 5,000 square foot lots in situ. So, right, so if you have two 5,000 square foot lots adjacent, they're yeah. combined. So I, so I guess, you, you know, your comment about, you know, for a similar lot, this would be more dense, and you're right, than what's allowed because we're at a 10,000 square foot lot standard now. So, even though there are some 5,000 square foot lots adjacent to the adjacent to this that I can see, mm -hmm. that's not a condition allowed in situ anymore. So we put an end to that because of the density. So, um, so I, you know, I go back and forth. I heard the argument about we want to treat you like everybody else, but actually going forward, you know. 10,000 square foot lot is the minimum, so that's all I had for now. Okay. And I also just wanted to add one question. Again, this is more just about like the character because this is the, the existing house elevation and this is the proposed elevation. Was there any thought or consideration trying to minimize this elevation? Yes. Like, for instance, putting the gable in the front as opposed so it would match, or so at least it would be yes. visually consistent. Yeah. Because to me, they uh, it kind of they, they this one sticks out because it doesn't seem to fit. Right. The um, if I can address a few of those items. Um, <laughs> one is that, that the existing structure is uh, 44 and a half feet in depth, 24 and a half feet in width, and the proposed is 31 and a half feet in depth and 23.67 or 23 feet 8 inches in width. So. Although they're approximately similar width, you know the, the new is a, a foot smaller. The uh, the new would be almost 13 feet, actually exactly 13 feet total shorter on the depth. Okay, the, this one uh, error that we made on the on the plans in the pack, and I, I wanted to clarify that on, on the plan here. In order to stick with the subordinate language in in 530. Um, the front elevation is this elevation here. The gable uh, does does face the street, right? Okay. Yeah. The street here. All right. There's also some language in there that addresses a uh, side entry, which we thought worked very well for this building. A, it gives us a side entry where uh, you know Maria from the existing home could keep an eye out. You know, a, a big fear of all signs of this corner, you know. So it really be like this person would wander off, and that gives visual, you know, visually gives uh, a, a good view of coming and going out of that, out of that uh, proposed structure. Okay, so it's subordinate in the way that the, that the uh, entrance is on the side, smaller in front, much shorter in overall depth, and a little shorter in overall width, um, and also set back on the lot um, to, to give it that subordinate look as well. The, I believe that the footprint that you see here is, is, um, makes it look a little larger because of the way that the surveyor outlined the entire footprint. Um, and it's, it's 13 feet total depth shorter than, uh, I guess, shallower than the existing. What was the, the thinking to come back up and provide a separate unit as opposed to adding on to the existing unit? Because she has two small children, and right now she's living with the parents in a, in, a, in their home in situ, and it's it just as a lot for the parents who have for the mother, specifically with uh, Alzheimer's, to have the, the promotion of the kids. A lot of I have two small kids, a lot of activity. It's separate, but uh, also able to be monitored. Okay. Questions on public? Raise your hand, introduce yourself so that we know who you are and ask your questions. Oh, you're, you're first. Me? Yeah. Okay. okay. Hi. Um, I'm Barbara McFadden, and I lived here two years ago. I, I, I love living in Situate, and I love my neighborhood so much. I live right next door to 33 Garden Road. Um, 35. I'm at 35. And 
It was my understanding that this new bylaw was to prevent overcrow overcrowding and overpopulation of uh, streets, and that um, if they're allowed to put a house on that 5,000 square foot lot, there are eight others in my one block area that could do the same thing. So um, we're really concerned about anybody establishing uh, another home on 10,000 square foot lot that, where there's already one home that could be rental property in forever. <laughs> so um, we just feel like it's detrimental to our neighborhood because it, say if you allowed her to do that, we don't believe there's a need um, for her to have a separate dwelling there. And if you allowed her to do it and eight other people on the street did the same thing because they wanted to have rental income, then we'd almost, one third more population, density, cars, et cetera. Um, and I thought the purpose of that 10,000 square foot rule was to keep that from happening. So uh, we're asking you to take a really close look at this situation so that it doesn't set a precedent. And um, the only th other thing I want to say is I, I moved here from West Virginia and I moved into a neighborhood 20 years ago that was 80% homeowners and 20% rentals and in the 20 years that shifted and it completely changed the neighborhood and I left after 20 years there because I'd been broken into four times and my house had been um, vandalized because what happens is um, it's not a good situation when you have more rentals than actual homeowners. Yeah I think that's a conjecture that, that I really... Yeah I'm just telling you my experience it's why I'm so passionate about not allowing that to start happening on the street when there's all these rentals. We already have four rentals out of 14. Point to point answer. Anyone else? Sir? My name's Alan Stewart. We're the first at Mobile Lab. We're right behind the um, property. Um, uh, I would like to ask a question first. I, I haven't, I've, I've heard a description of the property, but underneath the bylaws, there were specific intentions for the bylaw for accessory wall. I haven't heard what the intention is or what the, what the exception is that would, would allow this accessory wall. Uh, my understanding is that if you are in financial strife and that you may lose your home, this may be something that would provide you some some rental money so you can keep your home, uh, which I wouldn't understand if you can afford to build another home, why wouldn't you be able to afford to keep your home? Um, so I, I would like to hear uh, what the premise is that allows this to happen. Uh, in the bylaws, there's some specific, um, specific things for that. Sections of 531, you can Yeah, I think it's, um, to be honest, I think it's most of them. Um, A is to provide, to provide an opportunity for homeowners who can no longer physically or financially maintain their single family home to remain in homes that they might otherwise be forced to leave. Uh, Maria's intention is to occupy um, the property. The additional structure gives her wherewithal to, um, to have, you know, some short term to have some rental income attached to it and that um, I think it also speaks to the concern about having a lot of renters in the neighborhood it's I think very well known that an o owner occupied um, property even if there's a rental on that property is much more apt to be uh, safe and secure and properly maintained uh, in addition it allows um, the flexibility for the owner um, to take care of her aging parents in the future, and, and I think that that's that's also very tied in closely with 530.1a. Um, the 531.b uh, is is not is not applicable, but uh, provided various types of housing to meet the needs of the residents and workers. I think that is applicable. 
This is a very type of housing for a very specific reason that I've discussed as far as the occupancy and, and the future uh, condition of the mother. Um, and to protect the stability and property values and character of the single family residential neighborhood. Uh, and I, I believe that it does that as well with the uh, owner occupancy on the, on the site. Uh, and to legitimize conversions to enable the town to monitor conversions for code compliance. Obviously that, that would, um, you know, if, if she were to move her mother in with her into the existing home and you're trying to convert a small home, this is, that's exactly what that, it's in my opinion, it, what that uh, item is talking about. It's making sure that it's done right, that it meets the Mass State Building Code, that all life safety, you know, requirements are adhered to. So I think it's the, that's the vast majority of, of those items listed under 530.1. Thank you. Sir? I don't understand why we're discussing two 5,000 square foot homes, one 10,000 square foot lot. No, that we're They're discussing. All rolled. It's one 10,000 square foot lot. One, yep, exactly. Okay. Put okay. it. Any zone, in, single lot. Okay. Mm -hmm. How are we going to jam another house right next to it? Where's the advantage? Having a second dwelling, in my eyes, if someone was ill, I'd rather have it attached for safety purposes. I don't understand the separate dwelling and why it needs to be separate at all. Address that, John. Uh, I think I addressed that. The the, um, the owner has small children she needs to care for the small children she intends to do that in the primary structure um, she has short-term uh, rental needs in the accessory dwelling and long-term care needs for her parents in the accessory dwelling and it accomplishes all those goals for her uh, should it be approved may i ask a question I, if i remember correctly the owner is currently living off-site in another house with her parents and the what is going to be the main dwelling there is currently being held as a rental. That's right. And we're hearing that, at least for the time being, the accessory building will also be used as a rental. Not without her occupying the property. Uh, no, no, I understand that. Right. So she's going to move from where she's at now into the main building and rent the, the, uh, the accessory building after it's built. She's going to move into the accessory building when the accessory dwelling, when that occupancy permit is approved at which time the, the primary dwelling will be vacated. Mm -hmm. and she'll be able to apply for a building permit, separate building permit, to renovate the, the uh, primary structure. And then at that time, she can do the renovations required uh, that she feels are required to properly raise the family on the property. Thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe just some rebuttal comments. Um, actually, um, the uh, applicant has made uh, at least three different scenarios on why this was happening. So this is the third one we're hearing about her mother uh, with Alzheimer's. We actually heard originally, um, because we made an overture to her soon after we were notified of the letter to see what, what was happening. And in a conversation with Barbara, she said that she was going to evict the current tenants and move in and then rent that new property um, as a uh, corporate. corporate rental. Um, she told the tenants that she was going to move them into it, at least that's what they told us. So at this point, we're concerned that the rationale for doing this kind of doesn't hold water, at least over the last couple of weeks. Also, that she's really not ever lived in the house since she bought it. She's been renting it. She's not a member of our neighborhood. If she had lived there and has an infirm family member and she needs to add on to her house to make an in-law apartment, that seems that that's a, a need, a physical need or a financial need that she'd have to do. The deed is dated 2006. Right. She's been renting it for at least four years that I know of, and, it might, and I don't know that she lived there before that. I don't know that she ever lived there. I've been living there five years. I, I've never seen it there, so I don't, I don't know that. I can't speak to that. But I, but I am concerned that she lives with her parents now with an infirm mother, 
but she's going to move. It, it doesn't kind of just make a lot of sense to us, and it's not our place to make sense of it. Our place is we're concerned about the purpose of the bylaw, meaning financial or physical harm, so that you're going to lose your family home. This clearly isn't a family home, it's rental property. Secondly, that her saying she's going to live there, you know, how do we ensure that over time? And I must agree with Mr. Monger. Is that it? Mon oh, Monger. Monger. Monger? I'm yes. sorry. No it's going to look like another house. And although I live very close, I'm like eight feet from my neighbor, but my house exists. I'm not building a new one on a tiny lot. So those are some of our concerns. And I was also to ask if you saw the letter we sent, which mm -hmm. pretty much outlines you know, what our concerns are. We all have Thank that. Thank you. Just for Christopher Patch, 82 Normal Actually, I represent my wife, uh, her mother in law. She couldn't make it tonight. 42? So 32 Holly Grove, which is directly behind this lot. Um, and our concern, obviously, is with the density situation here. Um, what I have here in front of me is a picture of a house that sits to the left of my mother in law. This house directly abuts and actually through a garage that was later connected, whether it was proved or not, this, this house now sits right now and abuts her lot line. Um, we've got some very, very tight uh, areas, especially down along Holly Road that um, if, if you're lucky, if you've got You've got eight feet between houses. So what if you if you actually took a bird's eye view of this two or three block area, everybody is butted up against each other. And all this is gonna do is put another house on a five thousand square foot lot. I mean that it's the only way to look at it. And the confusion in the bylaw, four hundred says ten thousand square feet, and that's it. You get in a five hundred and they're saying we're allowing it in that free district. They contradict each other. So the question is, what takes precedent? The bylaw for the accessory dwelling, or the bylaw that was passed a long time ago that said 10,000 square feet, single family home. So this is what's happening. We're, we're putting a single family home on a 5,000 square foot lot. Not on really an accessory dwelling that can we can sneak in because we meet the setbacks. I mean, I've got an empty lot right next to me right now. I got a 5,000 square foot lot. I'm thinking to myself, boy, if they could do this, why can't I do it and make a little money on the set? I really don't see this as being a necessity. I, I, I'm really confused as to why they just couldn't go up or why they couldn't just bump out. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. And, and, the, and the lot itself, I mean, you guys are looking at it from the standpoint of a plan. That's the lot. So you're gonna put another house, the existing house is 897 square feet. You're putting one in there at 745, and a driveway in between. And the existing house basically has uh, exactly eight feet, which is an existing driveway where they butt up to this woman here. You're just basically making it more dense. And I'm sure when the accessory dwelling law for R1, R2 was passed, that made sense. You know, getting it into an R3 district, well, if you've got 10,000 square feet and this is going to be behind your house and it's not going to affect anybody to the left or the right or behind you, that makes sense. This doesn't make sense that you're butting up against Alan here, you're butting up against, I'm sorry. Barbara. Barbara. And, and my mother is right behind her and then we, <coughs> we, we, we've got this monstrosity of a home that was allowed to be built to add it on to the point where now it's, it's basically one entire it's taking the entire footprint of a lot. So it's a density issue, and that's really our concern. Hi, Jean Briette from 38 Garden Road. I just, if I could make two comments, I grew up in Sand Hills on Rebecca Road, um, and my parents still live there, so I'm very familiar with the houses being very close. Um, of course, when I grew up there many years ago, it was mostly beach community and summer bombers, as we were called. Um, and I understand, as my parents did, their house is now a year-round home, but is only occupied in the summer. 
And I think the noise level and the tolerance for the amount of people that inhabit that space in the summer is tolerated because a good portion still remains people who are only there in the summer. Our street happens to be um, a neighborhood that people go to work every day. And when the net noise level, when I can hear my neighbors talking on their deck at 10 o'clock at night, I'm trying to sleep because they're eight feet away and I have to go to work in the morning and their teenagers are out on the deck and I have to get up and go ring the bell and ask the parents, would you please tell them to go in the house? You know, in the summer I can tolerate, you know, when do you start not being a pain in the neck, you know? Um, and teenagers deserve the right to be social and whatnot. But um, my second comment is, I think this gentleman pointed out, if you're willing to rehab the building after you build the accessory dwelling, why not just go up and make it either a two-family or a second unit upstairs or something that at least goes up and keeps in within the neighborhood. A lot of houses that were s small singles have been built on top of and added to. And so if she's going to spend the money to build a building and then rehab an existing building, why not just do it all at once and go up and make it a little less obvious, a little less dense, a little less crazy. And if and it would be probably better controlled rental if you've got somebody living on your head or below you, just in terms of the noise and the tolerance for what would go on there. Anybody else? Hi, Kim Stewart. I live at 47. Um, more or less. We're right next to them. I have um, a concern about privacy. This tree here is, which was taken from my backyard, this is a tree that is on her property line. I believe it's, it's on the property line. I'm not sure if it's on ours or on hers. It's a very large tree, and um, when if this is approved, this building will this tree will have to be eliminated. Therefore, I'll have absolutely no privacy whatsoever between my house and her property. Plus, there's other smaller trees in her yard which will also have to be eliminated as well. And um, it says that this accessory dwelling will be eight feet off the property line, which probably maybe another five or six feet my garage would be there. I'm concerned about fire hazard as well. So that falls in the density issue, I guess. I'm Susan Lyons at 40 Garden Road. I have a couple concerns. I'm sorry, 40? 40. Um, one of them is that uh, the, the purpose of the bylaw that it seems that they're applying under is so that they can physically and financially remain in the home and not be forced to leave the home. So I guess that confused me a little bit because they don't live there now. No one's going to force them to leave the home that they are in now. So I'm a little confused on that. Also, um, with again, I thought one of the purposes of this was to put an accessory dwelling to create rental property to solve the financial hardship issue. But it seems like what I'm hearing is that there'll be this short-term period and who knows how long that'll be, and that then it, the intention is for the parents to move in. So I don't know how that um, you know, speaks to the financial aspect of it. That, that's, she no longer is renting that property, presumably, if her if parents move in and one of them is sick. I mean, I don't know that that's really a rental situation. Um, it, just to echo to what some of the other folks have said is, it is a very dense neighborhood already. I mean, and the, and the minimum lot is 10,000 square feet. The law's been that way for a while. And we already have homes that are, um, you know, on 5,000 square foot lots, but they were built before the law was changed. Um, we just feel like the law was changed for a good reason. It is already a very dense neighborhood. And we'd hate to see, you know, more and more houses just sort of be shoehorned in there. Um, We are concerned as well as setting a precedent as one of the gentlemen in the back said, if, if this is allowed to go in on such a small lot, then what's to stop everybody on the street from going in? And what, what I've researched and seen is most of the accessory dwelling special permits that have been granted in recent history are under very different circumstances and they're not lots this small, they're much bigger lots. Um, and they're also, um, you know, other circumstances have been somebody's trying to put up a garage or a barn or something like that that's not a home to live in and that there's just some space problems that 
that need to be dealt with. So it, it seems that recent approvals haven't been really even close to this set of circumstances. And to us, you're just circumventing the, the, the 10,000 square foot minimum by putting this house in there. And again, I, I just am a little confused about which the purpose of that, if it's for the parents to move in later. I'm also concerned if, that if the applicant um, is going to move into the accessory dwelling and then rehab the original house, I mean, is there a time frame there? She's not going to occupy it and, and having a rental yet. So, you know, is there a time limit there? How long does she, um, is allowed to take to rehab this and, and then prove that she's going to occupy it? I have a lot to respond to. The um, she she will just in response to the last comment. She will occupy the property, uh, as I said, from the moment that a certificate of occupancy would be granted on the accessory. Um, I I also in response to some of the other cases you know that have been that have been uh, heard for accessory dwellings, as she mentioned the um, the rental aspect of the. Um, bylaw was, I think, specifically um, addressed in the 129 Stockbridge Road uh, application on May 3rd, 2012, and also the 130 Country Way application. Um, and the, and there's, there are smaller, there are other, you know, lots of, of, of this size and uh, very large lots uh, where these have been approved. Uh, I believe, I don't have the numbers here, but I believe that I was Grove Street and Bridal Lane lots may have been in, in the same range. Um, the I neglected to mention, and I should have, that um, we distributed a letter to all of the interested parties that were uh, here at the last hearing to invite them to come in to um, to my showroom, uh, my office in Marshfield, and um, review the proposal. Uh, review. Any specific uh, questions or issues, um, all aspects of, of the design, of the site work, of the utility work, um, so things such as the, the issue with the uh, with the tree. I think that those are the type of things that we wanted to try and flush out and, and answer at those at that meeting. Um, I I did speak with um, uh, Kathy at, uh, after distributing that letter, but. <coughs> Everyone declined to to meet uh, either in a group or in person about uh, about this proposal. Um, I'd like to ask. I, I, I'm not sure which tree it is that you're concerned with. Uh, is it? Uh, did you say that on between 32 and? Um, the largest the tree, largest on the tree on the lot. The back of the lot between yeah. 32. That would. It's not the back. It's up the middle of the lot. It's uh, it's <coughs> two thirds on. Uh, this is my garage. This is the tree. Hours. And this is your garage here? Yeah. It's, it's probably about a hundred year old tree. So it's no small tree. Right here. Exactly. So it's right here. You're right not going to dig a, you know, and a trench this next to it. It's getting a decent friend. And now we have to go because I'm sure there's a spread through both yeah. properties. Yeah. So it's quite significant. Yeah. Let's have a single. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We've got a lot of people talking. Right. I want a single right. meeting. I'd like to, uh, you know, the, the tree, it's, I don't believe that we're taking down any large scale trees uh, as far as this proposal is concerned. The, the two trees that are affected, I tried to, uh, I had the surveyor detail specifically, it's a, there's a small grouping of trees that's, as you can see, right in the middle of the proposed accessory dwelling and one in the driveway. Um, it was my understanding that, that those are uh, small tree groupings that, that it's not that very large, very old tree on the side. You're not showing the tree on your plot. It's not on. It's, okay. yeah, it's sure. not on this. Okay. Well, then it's my understanding that it's that it's not affected beside aside from pruning. And again, it's just my understanding that it's not affected by the proposal because it's it was uh, you know we directly asked the surveyor to address any trees that would be affected by the proposal. So well, that's why he showed. Basement for for this. That's a full basement. Yeah, it's a full basement. Um, in addition, uh, I, I, you know, I think that I understand and hear a lot of the um, um, 
opposition to the uh, to the project, but I, I, I also think that it's um, more of opposition to the to the bylaw than the actual project. And I don't know, you know, uh, what that specifically means for my proposal, but I do think it's more of a of an issue with the bylaw than it is with the with um, with the proposed project at all. And if I if um, if there are you know if there's further deliberation needed and and, uh, and and another meeting needed, I would like the opportunity to clearly show maybe with some color renderings um, that the proposed structure would be subordinate to the existing. Because I really do believe it will be. Uh, that's the way it was designed, and I think a lot of the features of, of how it's situated on the lot, how the uh, uh, gable end faces the road, and how it's set back on the lot will really be displayed in a, in a rendering if, if, that's what, if that's what the board wishes to see. Uh, we got some more questions. Gentleman in the back. If this is, meets all the guidelines, the applicant's claiming she's going to live there, if she does not live on the property in, in the main dwelling, in effect, that violates a special permit, which means that the, the, that building doesn't exist. So you so can't rent it out. You can't be rented, right? Well, it has to be an owner. It doesn't have to be her. It has or to be. Owner. We can put the condition that it be owner occupied. Yes. yes. So we can put that condition on, but it would be unusual to designate a specific person. Has no, to no, I'm not asking person. for a person. Yeah, and we yeah. usually do that on <coughs> our conditions. We put owner has to yeah, occupy you know, the primary that's residence. That's, that's, what I heard yeah. Was that you could have a condition that. Well, we don't, we don't put that. We just put it as a condition in the permit. So I, basically what you're saying is correct. We can put a condition like that on there. I just want to say he referred to two, two um, accessory dwelling um, decisions you made on two properties. It was additions. And we, w we, don't want, we don't want a separate building, but an addition, if that's something that she needs for her mother, would be fine with us because it would still look like a single family dwelling and not two houses on the 10,000 square foot property. But that's not what she's interested in. Um, but so anyway, I just wanted to make sure, make it clear that when he said you've approved that, it's uh, country way. Yeah, country way and Stockbridge Road. Those were both additions for, one was a daughter and son-in-law, one for in-laws. Not at some future time it'd be for the in-laws. Um, and it was an addition. She's not asking for an addition. She's asking for a rental property. To clarify, th those two decisions did, though, discuss rentals. They did, dis they did say if rented, uh, additional parking or whatever the concern was would be provided. So uh, my reference to those properties, and forgive me if I wasn't clear, but that was in response to the rental aspects of the discussion. Can you, since that was, I thought that was a good point, can you explain again why she wants the separate units um, in the sense of, I mean, you could still have a completely separate unit, but having it be an addition. I don't understand the rationale or what the, maybe you can help me understand why she was saying to have it be yeah. detached as opposed to just attached. Yeah, I believe well, the her go away. recent experience of living in the home with her parents, with two small children, knowing, uh, you know, that, that, you know what issues that that brings up um, provided her initially to to um, want to have a detached um, structure for the accessory dwelling it also helps to provide as i said the short term uh, you know an easier um, rental income as far as the short term before because the mother is not in a condition now i i heard the word infirmed used if she's not in like that condition right now All right but i guess the they can be completely separate units, but share a wall, or not even like be able to walk through them. So, like, what's I don't understand the issue in the sense of uh, the the children. 
because I mean they wouldn't be able to enter into the other unit anyway. It's completely. It's not like it's another bedroom. They just open up the door and they're there. Or you could put the door there and simply leave and it then, locked. Uh, for exactly. Use. Understood. But I, I, I don't. I mean, I think she was. You know what I was instructed to do was to was to design um, this separate unit in com in compliance with the guidelines right. and bylaw, and that's what I. I, so, I, um, I, I guess what I'm. My only response to that is that she, she feels that that gives her the most flexibility and the best opportunity to a raise a family and care for in the future care for her mother, um, and um, that's you know a personal thing that I didn't get too into. But that's what I was instructed to do, and that's what I believe I did in the uh, as far as the design intent with respect to the bylaw. Right, and I understand that, and I appreciate that with the design intent and the bylaw. I was just trying to figure out her, if you knew her reasoning of a, a detached unit versus a unit that was attached but still completely separate. My understanding is is flexibility is important because, as I said, she, she will, she does intend to rent the accessory dwellings until such time that your parents need to move in. And um, so that speaks in my mind, that speaks to flexibility. And then the recent experience of children with their parents in the same house. may be there for a year and a Overwhelming experience for a lot of single mothers. Exactly. Which is allowed. Since you brought up young children, can I ask the age of the children? Can, uh, that be appropriate? I thought they were teenagers, that's why. Um, and then I was the one, um, we received the letter, so I want to acknowledge that since it was referenced. Um, I actually called Mr. Townsend, we, we talked, and we really thought that we'd already seen the plans a lot. We'd all been down to the office, thank you very much, multiple times. And we actually had talked to the applicant already and heard two versions of what she was going to use the property for. So we really didn't think there was anything to be gained. And we don't really have an issue with sandcastles at all. So that, that really wasn't the issue. And that's yeah. why we deferred the meeting. Uh, de we did vote the meeting. Okay. Questions, comments from the board? Nope. Robert? Well, uh, I'm going to go back to what Richard said. Um, now, it seems to me that you could have investigated a little more something that would have butted those two units together with a party wall, um, as, as sturdy a party wall, as soundproof a party wall, as fireproof a party wall as you would have perhaps in a duplex or a townhouse situation. It certainly uses up a lot less site. The setbacks from the property lines are substantially greater. Um, I, I would think that would be something that the neighbors who are here tonight would uh, respond to more positively. And uh, I can see the, I can certainly see the reasoning for that. I don't think it compromises the utility of either the existing building or the new construction uh, with a few minor changes to the plan. Um, I've got a feeling it could work just as well as it does as a separate, a totally separate dwelling. Be a little uh, cheaper to heat. You don't have a, as much exterior wall. Maybe even a little cheaper to build. You don't have to build as much new exterior wall. But that's that's going to be incrementally minor. Still, it's it's it seems like a reasonable idea to me to look at it that look at that possibility. Richard. Yeah, I just wanted to make the same comment. I mean, I feel like the neighbors are being very reasonable and saying, you know, absolutely. They're not saying no. They're saying we want to work with you. And that working is potentially could be what Bob was proposing, uh, that it's, you know, an addition. And personally, I don't under I still don't understand the reasoning uh, between having a, a separate unit and one that's attached because you know, we've all lived in apartments and condos, and you know, I lived in a condo for years and never heard the people next door to me. Um, so I think that it, it certainly could be done very well where you're not hearing noise or the children wouldn't be affected. Um, so that, I'm not quite convinced. I don't quite understand, I guess, where she's coming from 
and understanding that why she wants this completely separate <coughs> uh, accessory dwelling as a separate structure as opposed to being you know uh, an attachment onto the existing house and I think like I said the neighbors are very willing to to work with you as a compromise so that's kind of where I'm thinking about yeah yeah um, you know, my main concern, I think, is the, the density with the area. Um, you know, to me, clearly this doesn't appear subordinate to the other house. I, you know, I know there was an effort made to turn it and things like that, but it's virtually the same footprint, and it really looks like another house on another lot. So from that, that standpoint, I don't think it meets the intent or the requirements of the condition. Um, you know, there is a precedent here, I guess, there are a number of 10,000 square foot lots in the area. Um, I'm concerned about that. I mean, that was put in place to prevent future 5,000 square foot lots, but at the same time, I think we have to be sensitive that if someone has a 5,000 square foot lot and there's a real need for an accessory dwelling, I don't think we want to foreclose that opportunity for everybody. But I think if you're going to do that, you have to demonstrate a pretty strong need for it and, you know, clearly, you know, hit on every one of these in a big way. So, um, you know, there are some, some more concerns about, you know, densifying that neighborhood and traffic concerns and adding more, whether it's rental or ownership, just it, it's pretty tightly constrained now. So I think there is a real traffic safety concern, all of that noise concern. Um, I don't want to say I wouldn't support any application if you redid the design somehow or something along the lines of what Bob was talking about because, um, you know, some other people may come back to us in the future and have a real need for that. So, but I, I'm not supportive of the application the way it is now. I don't think it meets the spirit or the intent of, or the requirements um, of the special permit. Robert? No, I'm, you know, basically said what I wanted to say. I think it needs some further investigation. I think there are other ways to do this that aren't as invasive I can't support this um, the word that keeps screaming in the back of my mind is disingenuous and spell it with it. <laughs> yeah let me chip on um, I, I find myself in the same dilemma that, that I think that the rest of the board has and I think Dan very eloquently described at least my concerns one is this I don't think it's subordinate I don't think it fits uh, density is an issue I, I get very concerned about the time frame. In the near term, we're going to do this, and then in the long term, or in the next term, we're going to do that. Um, that, that concerns me. And somewhere I, I, I've got the same issue that, that Richard has. Is, is it seems counterintuitive to me that I would have, if I had children that need to be watched and I had a parent or parents that needed to be watched, it would seem to me that I'd want them as close as I could in the same structure rather than having them separated. Uh, on it, but that's I, I, from my standpoint, that's just intuitive to, or to, to my thinking uh, on it. And the way the application is now, um, I clearly can't support it. Um, so I think at that point, we can do uh, one of two things, I guess, because you, you need four votes that, to get your get the special permit uh, with conditions. I don't sense that you have the four votes here on the board. Um, <coughs> what we can do is, is I could give you the opportunity to withdraw the application or we can come back and formally vote the application. So I'll give you the opportunity to withdraw the application if that's what you'd like to do. And if um, uh, my client is receptive to an attached um, accessory dwelling, would it, then, then you would be a new application? Then it would be a new application. Like obviously. I think, let me just check with Laura. The, the, those are the two, 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 two alternative paths that we've got. So we've got a request from the applicant which, to withdraw the application. Uh, do I have a motion to accept that withdrawal? I have so moved. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you just scribble out a little note? You know, to the board. Um, this is to request that you would put the application. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
But I think you're spot on. If you come back and put the yellow, separate the two of them. Oh, yeah. I mean, that you could put even a green one in between them, and that would be the entrance to both units. And there's lots of good things. Yeah. 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 Okay, the next item on the agenda is the. Um, are you here for the Form A plan? Yeah, I'll be for the Form A. Yeah, well, yeah. well, as long as they're still cool, bring them in. Yeah, <laughs> we don't want them hot and angry. The, the temperature here is quite nice. Cutting back, we got rid of the easel. We put a, a chair. <laughs> We're cutting back on the budget. We took down the easel and we put up a chair. Flexible furnishings. Yeah. There is an easel right there. This. There is one right there. Use that. Right. The window. Oh. Right there. No. So, sorry, you got caught in the rain with that plan. <laughs> Actually, it's got a little time. My basement on so. <laughs> It's happened to me too many times. I recognize it. <clears throat> no, I, I think that's the first time in you know, my whole time on the so board we've ever declined anything. Really? Yeah. Okay, introduce yourself, sir, and one other tell time. us what you're looking to do. When we're getting sued. Okay. Uh, <coughs> I a couple weeks ago. You know, we got actually the plan signed, but basically we, uh, we did some modifications. Um, I believe is that the plan that I have marked up with modifications? Uh, this is the one that's signed. There is one that's marked up with modifications. I can I can tell you what changes made. Anyways. Uh, this, these lots that um, my name is Jeff Bull, and I'm representing the stands. They just want to reconfigure the lot lines of the two existing lots. These are their two existing lots. Um, so that's from that 22, Black 10, 2, and 3A. And what they want to do is. Okay. So basically, this is going to be the post lot 3. Pros lot four. This is this plan has been submitted to Land Court for their pre file review, which they've gone through, and I've incorporated some modifications that they wanted. Uh, one of which was to this is lot four. Um, they wanted me to label the dimensions on the easement uh, for lot three across lot four. Um, Really, there wasn't really anything else substantial that they wanted me to change. I, some other modifications I did were to add these proposed bound locations here and here. Um, what's that? Street number. Oh, street number, yes. This is uh, 125 Van Hill Road is, is what the proposed lot three is going to be, and 370 Hadley. So, or this lot four, proposed lot four. Those, those numbers, that numbers were given to you what, through the fire department, through the DPW, and the Oh, oh, the street addresses, yes. Street addresses, right, from DPW. And, um, yeah, the lot numbers are next to the lot numbers for case 540D, which is <coughs> what this is at Nashville. Uh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the, the, the changes that were made were really just edits. Uh, I mean, like I said, I, and I did submit a plan that was marked up with all the changes. And we, we had that. The, the, the configuration, the config, lot configuration didn't change. And the lots were designed to residence A2 specifications, which is what they have to be designed for. Yeah. Even though this one <coughs> is not in, it's actually in A3, but it goes more than 25 feet into District A2, this is the only one. So it had to be designed to residence A2 specifications. So. <laughs> Questions from the public? <coughs> Sir? Yes, uh, my name is Don Nagel, and I'm here on behalf of the Navarre, the uh, Sullivans. And I do have a couple of questions and concerns I'd like to bring to the attention of the board if I may. Okay. Um, one is the, um, the so called rat tail piece of the lot. If I, could I approach the board? And sure. Point it? This lot here, I'm not sure what lot three I guess it's identified. And I just wanted to ask the board um, whether that configuration of the lot conforms with uh, with our uh, zoning vote. Uh, if I may just finish my question. Yeah. Um, so one aspect of my question is whether or not that, you know, the configuration of the lot, obviously it's an unusual, um, configuration and I understand so whether or not that configuration is in compliance with situate zoning and secondly my understanding the reason for that is to provide uh, access to the sewer on Hadley Road to lot 3 and um, that um, whether or not that's that's allowable uh, to um, to access sewer from uh, the street for a lot that doesn't have uh, legal frontage on the road where the sewer uh, is accessible because the the access, my understanding is the legal access is on on, on Man Hill Road and not uh, not Hadley Road. So that's those are like two two questions about that, and the third point about this piece of the the uh, lot is, it's not shown on this plan, but um, right where, what is identified on the plan is a concrete wall, which basically cuts right through the, um, that, that leg, if you will. Just east of that concrete wall is the septic system for this lot, for, for, the, for the solvents. And I don't know whether the, that's been brought to the board's attention, but so those are three things with regard to that particular aspect of the of the lot that I'd just like to bring to the board's attention and and uh, inquire as to its uh, conformity with local zoning. Can I address some of those issues? Sure. Um, one of the first things I did was get basically a thumbs up from Neil Duggan at zoning that this configuration would be allowed. Um, the, reason, the reason we had to have frontage, we had to have, I also talked to Bob, the uh, guy, yes. And he had told me, they had some meeting back in the fall. He said, in order for you to hook up, and this is all proposed, you know, so really it doesn't affect the subdivision, but to answer the question is just, <clears throat> you know, to show that what we're doing isn't a waste of time. Um, Bob Rollins had a meeting with other people and they had decided that in order to hook up to a utility in a road, you have to have frontage on that road. So that's why that's there. And that's why the utility easement is there as well to just give them more space to work there. Yes, the Sullivan septic tank is here, but they also have a sewer hookup. So um, yeah, there's septic, I believe it's, I don't know what it is. I mean, it would appear to be accessible, but I never pulled it. Um, is the easement they have a the sewer hookup, so I don't know why. I'm, are they intending to use the sewer hookup? What are they intending to do? Is the easement on, on, the, on the Sullivan property or the property, the other property? No, it's, it's on lot, three, lot four. Okay, and who owns so we're, not on, we're not on the Sullivan's property at all. 
there, you don't have to what, actually, what he was saying you don't is have to actually excavate that rat tail. You're going to be excavating in the easement on the orange lot, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, right. <clears throat> yeah, they're not going to be going onto the Sullivan's property. Or even in that little sliver that you've that you've provided for front. Well, possibly there may a be bit, a little but that's, bit only, that's only like three feet. You're not or depending on that. Right. <coughs> Right. That's why they've got 15 feet to run the utilities in the easement there. Uh, trying to think what the other <coughs> what was no, the other issue? There's no requirement for minimum frontage, right? There's no minimum frontage. Well, you they have frontage on Manhole Road. No, no, what he means for sewer. I mean for the, for, to hook up to the sewer. There's no minimum well, dimension for that. Uh, no. Actually, the stamps have been pursuing this. I was, and then they've been talking to people more recently than I. Um, this week, but that's why I showed, uh, and I understand that's why they want 13 cops to the plan as well, so that the, the water and sewer people can review the plan. That's why I showed the sewer and water that's across the street and the services for proposed lot four, uh, so that <coughs> you can see that you know it's clear, there's clear access, there's no other utilities, you know, there's no <coughs> utilities a lot across the street. Such that they'd be competing for space on the on the sewer or water main. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, on, on the tie-ins. Right. Yep. The so reality is, what we're doing is just changing a lot line. Right. We're right. We're not right, saying right. that that's adequate for the sewer, or the that's sewer right, would be right, connected, right. or that they that's could get sewer right. sewer off Hatherley versus mm -hmm. the, the, the frontage. We're not right. giving those not it's And also to address oh. your 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 issue about zoning, that's why I added this note here that says. Planning board endorsement. Uh, planning board endorsement of this plan indicates only that the, the plan is not a subdivision under MGL Chapter 41, Section 81 L, and does not indicate that the lots are buildable or that they meet zoning, health, conservation, or general bylaw requirements. So, if it's approved, it'll be so. If anybody, here, if, anybody <laughs> if anybody in the board is worried, that's why I put that note there because no. it was also suggested in the subdivision, the A and R regulations that a note like that might be required so I just put it on there. Yeah, you'll also to the extent it gets approved it'll be signed and stamped by this board to the same effect. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it was <coughs> signed actually a couple of weeks ago. And almost I signed it. <laughs> hey any other questions in the board? Motion from the board? Yeah. Uh, I have I have uh, one or two more if I may. Okay. Um, just a couple of points on what was just discussed. Um, if the if the um, if the sewer pipe is going to be built in the easement rather in the as opposed to the rat tail, then the um, the sewer wouldn't be accessible by frontage. It would be accessible by virtue of of the easement, uh, which brings to to me anyway the question of whether or not that is um, <coughs> a proper and the other issue is whether or not you know there is a rule I looked for it I couldn't find it apparently there isn't one about uh, requiring frontage on the road where sewage is I mean frontage the definition of frontage is is its own definition of frontage and in the situation, it's at least in this one, it's 100 feet. Well, it's got frontage on Manhole Road. Yeah, but let me answer the question. I think both of those of those are valid points. Once construction starts, how do you get your permit to do the construction? <laughs> right. What this board is being asked to do is basically draw those lot lines that shows that rat tail and the two property boundaries. That's Understood. that's that's the extent of what this board is being asked to do, and what the extent of the, what this board can do. Yeah, and so <clears throat> so the really you're saying the only really valid question. It should be presented here is whether the size and configuration of that lot is does it meet the requirements for an, an, an right. A and R? Right. Yeah. Right. And is is given the unusual configuration, does that does that meet the uh, requirements? There are probably more rat tails in this town than you could ever shake a stick at. <laughs> There's going to be a lot more. <laughs> no, there, there are be a lot more given the definition of frontage that it's not. There's no minimum frontage. Yeah, well, as I say, that's that's not a definition that we provided. But but in terms of rat tails, there's a tremendous number of rat tails because we've got a fair number of subdivisions that have shared septic systems. 
it appears to me there'll be more if sewer connection is allowed through these kinds of rod tails. Uh, well, it's, the, it's the main has a certain capacity anyway, so. Yeah, well, that's, that's a different subject. But I think we're, 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 we're one more issue, and, I, and, and then I'll, I'll be done. Um, with regard to uh, practical access to the lot, if I could approach the board again and just point it out. Um, practical access to utilities is really what we're talking about here. But in terms of practical access to the buildable part of the of the lot is from Manhill Road, and um, the uh, the actual the ability to uh, install a driveway will be limited by the the FEMA floodplain and wetlands line, and um, and and the 50 foot no build setback for that, which leaves a pretty narrow area where a driveway can be built where vehicle traffic comes in. It's 20 feet. Uh, excuse me. And uh, the slope of Manhill Road is, is quite steep. The contours are shown on the plan. So my question is whether or not there's going to be adequate, you know, functional access to the lot given the, the, the uh, extreme slope of this, of Manhill Road turning into just a very small available area for, for lot three. I think when you apply for a building permit or you go to CONCOM, then I think that's, that would be the appropriate place to address those concerns. Well, the reason I brought it up now, Chairman, is because um, I'm bringing it up under the context of adequate access to the lot, which I think is part of the planning board's purview. It is under the ANR. Remember, we had the one before that had frontage on a street that they didn't have an easement to. So it is, they have to show that they've got the appropriate frontage, lot size, and then the um, access. But when I look at it, it looks like there is the 50 foot no build area, but then there's, I don't know how much, you know, 40 feet or so between. It'd be sort of up to, I think, CONCOM to decide what they wanted to grant them. So, I mean, when I look at it... Yeah, there is a window, I, I think. Yeah. But but I guess my point is that, I mean, the road is pretty steep. I'm sure you folks are familiar with it. And in order to get adequate access in such a steep angle, you probably have to build a... Uh, a uh, in, what's the proper word? In a retaining wall or probably something. Probably a retaining wall. They, they would, but I think for purposes of the ANR, it's just, you know, do they have access it's a pretty low standard um, we had one before where someone had frontage on a street that they claimed that gave them access and then we looked into it and they didn't have access rights as a private street so so technically they had no legal access so we had to have them go back and get an easement so it's but in terms of access I mean yeah, this is a public way. yeah they've got frontage on a public way yes there are going to be some hurdles for them to go through to get that but I, I don't think it rises to the level of saying they don't have adequate access and it you know, I think a lot of stuff you're talking about is going to be down the road as they go for building permit. And I do have a question for Laura as a follow-up though on the um, the accessing sewer. Is that just a DPW regulation? I mean, where does that pop up in terms of you can access sewer if you have frontage on the road? There, there is, is it a policy so of DPW I'm or I'm not sure whose policy it is. I've, I've heard that okay. statement. I've heard it from DPW personnel. So okay. I understand it's something they're using. I'm not sure what type of Yeah, because I, I just was curious about that because it doesn't appear in zoning or anywhere else. kind of outside of our jurisdiction, I think. But It's definitely way outside. But I'm just curious because I am concerned about, you know, the rat tailing in because I could envision someone doing something like that and building a giant 40B project, you know, off the road where that wasn't the intent. So I'm just... It's not applicable for what we're talking about now, but I am concerned about that as well from sort of a policy standpoint, and it probably shouldn't be done this way. Just uh, just a comment that some towns do have a lot shape factors and that type of regulation, and yeah. Citra just doesn't have anything like that. We talked about that one time, I remember, and we didn't get anywhere with it for some reason. Yeah, we had that lot shape factor. And um, Okay, that's all I have. You all set? Okay. Motion from the board? I think we have a motion. Um, I move to endorse as approved as approval under the subdivision control law not required a plan of land being subdivision of lot two 
Plan 5140-D, 370 Hatherley Road, 125 Manhill Road, Situate, Mass., prepared by J. Lowell Associates for applicant L. Jeff Lowell and owner Joseph R. Stanton, trustee. The Stanton Family nom Nominee Trust, revised date 8 2 12. Do I have a second for that excellent motion? Second. <laughs> those in favor? Aye. Aye. I will sign those after the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure where we are. <laughs> Next item, zoning. This is the... Before we do that, let's... No, 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 you're doing fine. Let's just step back and, and, and talk why we're doing them, and then we can talk about where we are, what we've done. Where we are, what we've done is you. <laughs> just, just so you've got that. Okay. Oh, so I thought you were going to do that. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I explained that where we are is all what you've done. Bill doesn't get paid enough to do that, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the DEP has approved a water withdrawal permit for Situate, which um, gives us a certain number of gallons that we a town and we're looking at um, <coughs> we're, we're going to be trying to expand that slightly um, or at least maintain it and one of the conditions of maintaining that water withdrawal permit is that we fix our zoning so that we're really protecting the land which contributes to the groundwater and also to the surface water areas in a way that the state is is really happy with that they feel meets the um, code of Massachusetts regulations and other um, state laws. So DPW, when they got this letter, asked me to work on some zoning, and I've been working closely with Jim DeBarros, who's the uh, water division supervisor, who some of you may know, um, and also with DEP personnel and with Neil Duggan, the building commissioner, and um, of course, you know, with all of you. Um, so we have some drafts that at this point I think are in pretty good shape to go forward. What has to happen in terms of this meeting is that the planning board needs to vote to submit these articles to the board of selectmen and that starts the process to get them onto the town meeting warrant. There's gonna be a town meeting either the end of October or the beginning of November. It really has not been set yet. It won't be the same day as the presidential election. That's about all we know, but we don't know exactly what day it's gonna be. Um, that all should come clear in the next couple of weeks. But in the meantime, um, to comply with that permit, we wanna get that zoning, you know, sort of started into the pipeline. The other um, zoning change that we have been talking about has to do with the village business overlay district and the fact that if you're going to use it, right now you have to have dimensional um, um, dimensions for your lot that meet the standards of the bylaw with just a couple of exceptions. And that's come into, um, into play where you've been looking at a proposal on a lot where the frontage doesn't meet zoning. And um, to address that, um, I've been working with the owner of that lot to a certain extent, but also trying to think about the greater good and what's really you know, good for the planning board and its you know, ability to control what happens and good for the town and so on. So there's a change in that language that's being proposed that would make it so you can waive that frontage if you know if you want to. Um, it doesn't add anything extra for the applicant to have to do, but there's quite a bit if you really look at the bylaw that they're supposed to do already. <coughs> they're supposed to provide public benefits and so on. Um, so that's the second zoning change. 
and that's that's what we have. But I thought I would spend a minute or two just distributing some maps. Um, I guess letting the public know that that maps are available of the change in this area that's being proposed. Um, you know, the area that's regulated for the water protection and just going through really quickly what the changes are to the zoning that deals with that water protection and distributing the changes to you all so you can see them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yes, absolutely, sure. Okay, okay so with the um, water resource protection district, the first map I'm gonna hand out has the existing district. Did you send out the changes that's the latest? I've got the latest here. This is not the latest. No, it really, you know, even today I was getting more feedback from DEP about some things I had to change. So. There was a newer one. So there's a newer one. Yeah. So this, but this is existing what we're working off of now as, as a comparison. What we're working off of now and if you look at, um, if you look at the blue line that's the outline of the water resource protection district. You see these little um, tongue type shapes that are the, the surface water zones around the tributaries to the surface water supply. Um, I think the one on the first to the right around uh, Stockbridge Road, I think that's the tan blue. Um, then there's one that comes up through through the Southern Estates property on, on to Elm Street. And then in the West End, there's one that comes off of Black Road. Um, I forget, it's not even Glen, but it's um, located. That huge swamp is out there. Yeah, the huge swamp is south of Black Road. So, mm -hmm. the map change would the beginning of Pound Brook back up there. Yeah. Yeah. That it is. The, um, the map change, which I think is the first of these changes that should happen in the water resource district, it would just extend that little blue line from these little um, shapes that represent the um, service water protection district. Really common sense change. <coughs> I don't think it's going to be controversial. Yeah. Yes, yeah. the, the only where these gray right? things are, like this is like a little piece right. that sticks out. Oh, oh those now she's taking oh, this and going around it. Okay, same thing over here. here. So right, <laughs> and nothing, <laughs> nothing yeah. else has changed. No. It's, yeah. only, it's, it's only like those pictures. Right. Right. See what the difference is? <laughs> yeah, I had to look too. You're faster than me. Oh. Do we have to vote yeah. it to recommend it to the select one? Yeah, or just to say that you want to submit it on the So that's all. Can we handle that and just get a motion to move that right out of the way? Can I, can I ask you a question real quick first? The um, So the, the dark gray areas, that's really wet areas pretty much, right? That's where the creeks are and surface water supply areas. Well, well, there's a creek in the center of that, but yeah. we think just in the center. I, I guess my question is, you know, like we're, we're capturing the gray area by going out there, but it seems to me like it would be a little bigger zone around that, you know, like most of the areas where we've got the gray area with the um, water resource protection district, we typically catch an area a little bit wider than that. I'm concerned about yeah. the narrowness of, you know, just it's probably just the minimum to meet the requirements, right, for this data. Yes. Like this. I mean, you'll see there's a lot of area on this map that's that's not in the green and it's not in the gray, and that's that's other contributing area that um, right. 20 years ago the consultants who worked on this zoning just yeah. you know kind of roughly developed a zoning district, and they thought, well, you know, based right. on the topography, probably all this area contributes in some way. Yeah, that's sort of the watershed of those of those tributaries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, I tend to think. I mean, some of the watershed I tend to think might be a little bit much, but 
I do look at the areas that clearly are more of the wet areas and we're defining it so tightly in those areas, but well, we I need mean, like another consultant to look at it, I guess. You but look at the scale, um, what is this here? Uh, is that 750, 750 feet? feet. It was so it could feet. be like easily 100 feet across here, yeah. probably more. Okay. Um, and, it, and it's probably, it's, it's not like a huge river. It's, yeah. it's just you know, small. So, so tell me this, so the state said basically we had to have our surface water supply all within, I mean, what did it say? Yeah. That's what it said. You have to include within your water resource protection district all surface water supply. Yeah. And then we realized yeah, someone's outside sense. of it, and so we're just capturing that. And, yeah. and then we meet yeah. the state requirement. And, okay. Yeah, it's really, um, okay. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, okay. Yeah, I'm fine with it. So you want to vote, vote oh. the map? Yeah, we better see those, I think, right? Okay. Good all at once. Okay. So, uh, nice, nice. No water in Harlem. Yeah. yeah. Came out nice. City of Homer. City of Homer. And they're only a few days apart. <laughs> Are they? August 2nd, oh, yeah. August 7th. Well, we Federal a, Republic of Homer. <laughs> regulations, there were a whole bunch of, okay, it looks like mine has like two, two first pages here, so if you got one with two first pages, um, we were having trouble with combination. Um, so on the third, on mine is the third actual page that starts, um, the second third page starts filling out these most of the uses in the old bylaw are in the new one, but there are some that, that aren't anymore. And these are things that DEP is just not requiring the town to regulate anymore. And um, so they're going to be taken out. Um, things like um, a hotel or motel, um, a photographic processing establishment. Um, I believe somewhere in here it's a business. Um, yeah, I see that. Airplane. Yeah, we can still do airplanes. Yeah. We can't do cars or yeah. boats. Self-service yeah. laundries. Yeah. Right. Um, yes. Self-service laundries. Oh, all of those types of things. How about my home-built airplane? I think one of the reasons is that the technology for dealing with some of the environmental impact of those things is so much better now that they, they just don't have to completely prohibit them anymore. Instead of prohibiting a whole use, like, like a hotel, they're they're prohibiting where the septic system is located. They don't want the septic system to zone A. They don't want um, hazardous materials stored, except that they're stored on a, um, a concrete floor. Um, so the actual activities that are the problem are being regulated instead of what the land use is. So does this track specific language from DEP? Yeah. 
Okay, so we didn't make any of this up. No. It's good. No, it was totally uh, the only way to only way to fly. <laughs> so, so now you can have grazing livestock and domestic animals within a hundred feet of Old Oak and Bucket Road. <laughs> <laughs> it's not specifically prohibited, but there are prohibitions <laughs> on how you handle the manure. Right. So they're looking at you know what's the you know what's the most um, significant thing about this and try to regulate that. I mean, if people want to keep that prohibition on uh, livestock, I mean, certainly that's you know, that's something you can do. I, I was just commenting. Never mind I me. Mean. Well, you might know someone that wants to, like, to have an alpaca farm. Or, <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, there is one up on Grove Street, and some folks that have llamas. Yeah, some llamas up there. Yeah. There you go. So, uh, I mean, so this, this does give me a little bit of concern. You know, I guess I haven't studied it enough, but. Um, but it was stuff that was already there, really. I mean, they, you see that everything. Well, they, we had a special permit process before for some of them, and now it's been eliminated. So now it's just either allowed or not allowed. I did exchange some correspondence with the EPA on that because I know that's something that, that um, yeah. could affect the They were very clear that they don't want the fish to process. Who, the EPA was? Yeah. Hey, I'm surprised at this. They're striking swimming, wading, or bathing in Old Oak and Bucket Pond Road. I would think that would still be prohibited. Well, if it's prohibited, that's the water department's, you know, Regulation, it's their authority that it would be prohibited. Oh, not rather than uh, something. I see. Um, it's an enforcement issue. It's the enforcement law. Right. So. Well, I, I, for one, would like to study this a little bit more because it's, I didn't realize the scope of the changes. I am always fear the unintended consequences, you know, and I know we've done stuff like this before, and then all of a sudden a giant house pops up. That we didn't expect and things like that so I, I mean if we're changing the uses all of a sudden obviously there appear to be allowing someone some that weren't allowed before there without a special permit how, how much how much latitude do we have to massage these kinds of things if as Dan's saying you know they, they they raise unintended consequences that maybe the state didn't consider when they began to dictate these terms and conditions to us. Well, these are mostly DEP changes, right? It's my understanding. So yeah, I, I think I can answer your question, yeah. and the answer is you can add in things, but, but you can't you take anything out or, or modify the language. Right. They're yeah. not going to let you no. do it. <coughs> like, like one word changes from right. what they have. They said, no, just use our language. And, and this is the uh, the. Department of uh, Environmental, Environmental, Protection. The Environmental Protection is yeah. is the one pushing this from the state. Yeah, the ones who give us our like, control over withdrawing water from the wells. Mm -hmm. So you're talking probably primarily about the prohibited uses where it gets into very specific environmental language that I'm seeing. I'm guessing that came from the state. The whole thing came from the state. But but not not like deleting, you know. Well, I mean, stabling, it, it, it hitching, standing, said. feeding, grazing, right? Yeah, if you want to add those, hotel, in, I'm motel. Sure there isn't any problem with that, but um, but, but you're saying the um, the other language, the the added language, or what you have in there, this is the state yeah. pushing this, and but, but but then but we could add other things in and do it by special permit. I mean, we can, uh, Eric, kind of to answer your question, this is a town zoning change, so you know the process, like anything, works. We say we recommend or we don't recommend it, the selectmen say they recommend or don't recommend it goes to town meeting. But no, I, I understand that, but, yeah. you know, I, I'm also hearing that the, the language is being dictated up from on high, and if we, if we were to make m changes, then the response would be, you're tough, tough out of luck if you want any water out of the wells this year. Well, I think we can be more restrictive. We can't be less restrictive. No, I, I understand that, Kinda too. Kind of like yeah. wetlands, yeah. 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 I mean, I think in some ways, some of the special permits that you may be thinking about, I mean, for instance, for stabling animals, that might make sense. But you'd have to go back to the, the other restrictions in here, and, and you couldn't be more liberal than, right. I mean, for instance, if you have to store more in a certain yeah, you still have to meet the other yeah. There, there is There is some special permit language here under paragraph 34 uh, for... I mean, I. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, oh, okay. Well, that's 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 a mistake. Yeah. Is that a mistake? Yeah, that's a mistake. 
I mean, my understanding before this was that you define the Water Resource Protection District, and for the most part, you could only do certain prohibited uses if you got a special permit from the planning board, basically. There were a number of listed uses, and you'd have to come to us, and our job was to make sure the appropriate protections were in place so it didn't damage the Water Resource Protection District, and, you know, they came up with a whole list of things that we were concerned about, from dry cleaning to cemeteries to whatever it is. Um, and now it appears that they've replaced that just for a system where here's a list of things you can't do and I understand that the state's saying you just can't have these in your water resource protection like something that generates a certain amount of hazardous materials and things right, like that right. but what we've lost by this is if we want any control above and beyond sort of the bare minimum state standard of you know if we're still concerned about that um, my impression from hearing about this water resource protection district the way it's worked in the past is that I think most people think it was too restrictive in the past and a lot of it a lot of it happens right in the um, you know the area down by the rotary and the um, the greenbush area yeah. so I've heard that from several people that you know because of this process it's hard to fit a lot of businesses in that area because of the process we had before so this could be better but well, I mean for instance taking out the yeah. Um, I think some people see that and they just go, oh, well, there's no point in yeah. having a hotel in this district. Yeah. But what they're not really, really understanding, or what DEP or the town didn't really understand, <coughs> that they have a hotel motel <coughs> with, a, with a wastewater plant, or um, you know, they're having a private package plant, for instance, that's where that's located. Um, you know, there's a way to connect it to sewer, then that's not. No. Um, I, I mean, I, I think the, the special permit that was there allowed secondary usage or storage of toxic or hazardous material in quantities greater than normally associated with household use. Well, what DEP is saying now is they don't want to allow any hazardous materials greater than household use, um, except if they spell out the, the conditions under which you know that could be allowed. Mm -hmm. So. It, it does, it's just a completely different approach from what was there before, and I understand it's, you know, it's, it's a change. I guess my concern is, like, just glancing out without having read it in real detailed is, you know, the prohibition on, like, storage of liquid hazardous materials, liquid propane, liquid petroleum products, and less incidental to normal household use, outdoor maintenance, heating. I immediately look at that and think, well, could the paint store have gone there, you know, with under this regulation? Yeah. It appears that it probably couldn't, and I'm not sure that's what we want for a thriving business district down there. Now, if the state's mandating this, if this came straight out of the state, which I'd want to verify, um, it calls into question, you know, do we need to have a much narrower district boundaries because that some of this could potentially kill a lot of opportunities in Greenbush, for example. So that's what's given me some pause here. I mean, I know we, I don't disagree. We've got to meet the state because we need our water. We're not going to get yeah. tonight our use yeah. withdrawal permit. But, you well, know, I if we pass this now, is that going to kill a lot of development in those areas inadvertently versus right. like redrawing the boundaries at the same time to maybe make them narrower if we can or something like that? Yeah. But, yeah, that, that number three there, you know, it's basically – household storage of materials. So you have a hardware store, you probably couldn't have one. Well, again, the areas that they're really concerned with the town are the green and gray. The, the right. blue is all, is all kind of extra. Right. On the other hand, there are going to be some political um, aspects to this, as there are with Everything. Exactly. And um, um, I, I did find out that um, it, it may be possible for the town to get an extension on the water withdrawal permit if this isn't, you know, if this isn't passed at this council. But, you know, I, I want to have some real um, feeling that we're, we're serious about getting this done before asking for yeah. You know, some really strong reasons for it. What, what's our, um, 
what's our time where we're not, it's a pretty tight process, I know, but. Yeah, it's a very tight process. Um, I have a. I, I mean, I, my guess is that there's going to be a lot of discussion about this at town meeting from the commercial interests. Yeah, the well, th there's that uh, that big service master franchise down there in Greenbush, and then there's the, the concrete um, fabricating company there, and I, I don't know how much of this is, you know, going to involve the stuff that they store. But it actually sounds like, from what I understand, that this is less restrictive than what it used to be. In some ways, it's more restrictive because of these additional items. Because of the yeah. 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 yeah, in some ways, it's less restrictive because, like, like you said, you know, grazing and stuff. You know, you had to get a special permit. They eliminated that, but then if you look at the these are all new. Look the at the permit. added stuff, um, it, and this doesn't allow it by <coughs> special <coughs> permit. It's just a clear prohibition. But you know, the one that caught my eye right away is at number three. You know, in the middle of all this stuff mm -hmm. that. Storage of liquid hazardous materials, liquid propane, liquid petroleum, unless storage is incidental to normal household use, outdoor maintenance, or heating of a structure. So I think about, you know, like the propane that they sell at the village market. Yeah. Right. You probably couldn't have a use like that in Greenbush yeah. under this. Or, or they had one down at the paint store. When yeah, they yeah, had or it, or you couldn't have the paint store again. And I think, I don't know if you remember, we had the one gentleman that came in that was talking about his um, auto. Right. repair shop right. and how there's nowhere he can locate and yeah. situate and that's and Mark's just, yeah fiber fact I just think we want to think that out and if you know I, we obviously have to comply with what the state requires because we need our water and we're not gonna <laughs> there's no choice in that but yeah and, and aren't there uh, you know like uh, emergency generators that have bottled propane in large quantities stored right there next to them probably you know? yeah so but you know what I but think there's an emergency about uses. I think no, I, I, I'm talking about if there was like a commercial, <coughs> uh, you know, um, here's Driftway, right? Natural right here. Are they, are they natural yeah. gas? So, in fact, the paint store would have been about right here. It's not really in the district. Hmm. Unless see. it's like. I, mean, I, thought, I thought all of Greenbush pretty much well, was. Well, not that the, part, but well, here's the part is right here. It's in the blue. Here's the, yeah. No, here's the Driftway. Oh, I see what you're saying, right? And so, like, the train station is like here. I don't know right. what this big parcel is here, but I mean. There's this is like the golf course. Yeah. So then this whole area looks like Greenbush, unless right here by the the, the um, Herring River is what they're referring to here. Yeah. Let me yeah. see. It I looks to me like it's outside the area. The two at work is not protected. Right where the, the green, I, the gray, and the blue. I was pretty sure it was because when he came in, he said that you know they were looking at that specific well, building, so maybe that's the line or something. I don't well, the know. the Herring River yeah. is right there. It is right there. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, and, and I'm not sure I disagree with that you wouldn't want that use there. It's just, I think there could be some unintended consequences here if we don't pay attention to it. And yeah. I just, well, I just hope to have a little bit more time to look at it, but I don't know if we have. <laughs> well, we, we have a little more time, but not, you know, not. Like our next meeting? Yeah, like your next meeting. Okay. And uh, what I would suggest to do, um, depending on what we have. Chairman of the Water Resources Committee, mm -hmm. um, who happens to work for the state, so he's pretty aware of some of these, you know, some of the state concerns, and you know, maybe invite some of those people in, and the Water Division. I mean, the Water Division people were supposed to be here tonight, so I'm uh, disappointed that they're not here. Yeah. Um, because well, this is very, very important. To I mean, for instance, we have situations, well, we, we have many situations in town that really do need control that are not being handled the way that they should be, regardless of what mm -hmm. the use is. So I think we need as a town to be serious about mm -hmm. that, but the way that we do it, I think it's the last time. Well, like, just looking at this, you know, the, the boundaries, here's 3A. Um, so pretty much almost the entire length of 3A is covered within the zone, right? from yeah. here yeah. to here and under the one I'm reading here that means you couldn't have a gas station up there a on gas Man station Hill. a grocery store yeah. it really uh, well, where would it say a, a grocery store because of the uh, well, it, well because uh, well because you can't have liquid hazardous materials okay, okay. other than household so would that be coke 
It'd be, yeah. <laughs> it'd be virtually anything. It'd be, you know, household cleaning stuff, anything that's not normal. How, I mean, well, I, I, it, would, it wouldn't fit, I know that. What, what about the, the, uh, so. the, um, the, the commuter rail? I, I don't know that we have any influence or control, but I don't know what they're storing there, and that would seem to me to be right down in the middle of this. It's well, not, it's yeah. outside the district. I was going to say, I think it looks outside. Totally is it? Outside okay. I think, well, um, no. I think the other thing that I think it's down do towards green to Yeah, inside. that's right. what I'm thinking. Right. I, I mean, um, what some of these terms mean, because sometimes yeah. even when you read the CMR, it's difficult to understand exactly what Yeah, mm -hmm. but also I, I just wonder if there might be a way to draw what's required by the state more narrowly while keeping what we have now for the other areas. You know, if you said they're concerned about the gray and the green, yep. I wonder if to comply with the state, we capture that and... You could certainly do that. That's why I'm talking about inviting in the Water Resource Committee because yeah. I think you'll you'll get into a good dialogue about it. Because, you know, my concern obviously with economic development and things like that is not foreclosing opportunities by overzealously zoning things. Yeah. So. Yeah. This well, looks like a broad, broad brush truck. I mean, clearly yeah. this will comply with the state. We just throw a line around the whole thing and we're comply. Yeah. But yeah. because our, our main, if you look at Chief Justice Cushion Highway, it runs right, right through that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. The main areas, the, the areas that you're required to regulate are the green, which is the wellhead protection districts, and the gray, and the gray. which is the surface water supply. You're not required to regulate anything else. Situate has always regulated that other you know, large area. And, and I don't and mind I, that because we yeah. have special permit process for that I, under the current, right? So we regulate it, but we can still permit things. It's not sure. a clear, and this is yeah. a clear prohibition. This says you can't do it, and there's no special permit process, so you just can't do it. That's been eliminated yeah. under this draft. Sure. I, guess well, I think it'd be easy to, to do what I think you're saying, which is to keep the special permit process for the the other parts of the district mm -hmm. that aren't required to be regulated but just regulate what you have to regulate that's what i'm concerned about i mean because that that to me is an easy mm -hmm. thing to explain at town meeting too you know this is we're doing the bare minimum to comply with the state everything else is staying the same if we're not doing that i just think it raises a lot of questions and yeah. especially on this type type of a time frame I, I just think it's going to cause problems at town meeting and a lot of concerns. And well, what I still think maybe is, is a good thought is that the, the uses that they formally called out, like a plating establishment and uh, stabling horses, hotels, dry cleaning, I don't think those are the only ones that, that produce <coughs> hazardous materials. Right. But you could ask for any business going through site plan review to give you, you know, their MSDS sheets. Mm -hmm. and, you know, have other um, yeah. other um, approaches to making sure that they're mm -hmm. managing those things in well, environmentally correct well, the way. way. To do, well, the way to do it would be to not even define it by the type of use, but just by what they store or generate, kind of like how the yeah. state's doing it. You don't yeah. you don't say hotel or cemetery. You just say if your business generates, you know, hazardous Sorry. materials above normal household use. And you're in the water protection, then you have to get a special permit. Yeah, or, or then you any, capture any everything you need to. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, a little harder drafting. Plan review or whatever. Yeah. Uh, would be pumped up to a major site plan review. Yeah, yeah. if you're within the water uh, resource. Within yeah. the water resource protection. I, I'd be supportive of something more like that. You know, especially in a tight time frame, just to say, you know, if, if you think that's a possibility, to just outline the gray and the green put this into place for that, leave everything else alone for now, unless we have time to really vet it. And well, yeah. um, okay, so, okay, well that's that's another possibility, to leave everything alone in the blue area. Yeah. Keep the old district, um, but on top of that you'd have, you'd still have these, well, they do want, they do like the idea of this um, overall district. Yeah. I know. Yeah. So anyway, but but we could outline the overall district in a new way, but just regulate the green and the gray. Yeah, but we um, get two different objectives. Yeah. One is is that we don't want to preclude any any development, that, economic development that could take place on there, and they're looking at prohibiting, prohibiting everything. Well, I think there are going to be places where you know maybe oh, economic interest in the state. Or I understood. So yeah, like I'm concerned. If we went and, and covered the blue and the gray, no, the green, the green. and the gray. Yeah. Right. If we made these changes, then, the, then in effect, that would leave the, the areas in the blue 
that belong that would, would be regulated by the existing process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep. Can do that. So, um, and, then, and then the question becomes is you get Clarkson and his crew and who else do we need to, and we need in town to come back up and see if they would concur with that. Yeah. And then maybe a second step is maybe take a look at the areas not in the green. The green is another maybe in Springtown meeting next year of like doing what we talked about, kind of improve that a little bit. Improve that by law. Better special permit process. Yeah. yeah. Or a little more defined, not by kind of the outdated hotel motel uses we think are going to create it and just make it work a little better maybe. Okay. Well, at what so point does this have to get the selectmen for? Um, well, I think we could have one more meeting to, to discuss and, and review and take some action, but after that it's, it's about the selectmen. It it's just, it doesn't just require a public hearing in, oh, in front oh, yeah, of us, but once it gets to the selectmen. No, this is. no, but it, no, no this isn't a public hearing. No, not here. No. Um, once it gets to the selectmen, then they <laughs> They resubmit it back to the planning board, okay. and then we hold a public hearing. Okay. And okay. This is all got to happen by you know, the end of October. Soon, yeah. Another, so right. And um, at town meeting, I mean, would the people actually have to review all this to approve the changes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a handout. <laughs> people really like seeing everything that's being changed. Okay, well, I'm just asking. <clears throat> Put it up on the town website beforehand so people <laughs> have a chance to look at it. We did that with the whole zoning bylaw revision. It was online and handouts, you know, and I think a limited amount of people actually looked at it. <laughs> both, both people besides us that concern themselves with zoning in town. Exactly. Out. That's what I was going to say, but I wasn't going to name names, but yes. But both of them did. Because I, I got a call from one of them. Yes. <laughs> so where are we here? Name dropper. So I'm going to do uh, a revision of this, and I'm going to have to run it by DEP again and run it by John Clarkson, and um, I mean, I'm not going to run it by him. I can just let him know that there was, um, you know, there was some ideas, some new ideas that came out of the planning board meeting about how to approach this the best way. And, um, yeah, I think it would make sense to invite him. Either that or we can meet with him. I don't know when, when his group meets. I, I don't know either. Um, yeah. They meet monthly, so that may not happen Well, I mean, they weeks. They should be flexible enough they can meet more than one once a month. We can send our, send our liaison, Bill, right? Yeah. <laughs> send our liaison to meet and report yeah. back, right? I wasn't sure what I was going to do that day, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I think that. To have you come here than to have to okay. I, I think that route just makes a lot more sense on this kind of time frame and just, you know, it's, yeah. it seems a, kind of a complicated thing otherwise. We're doing the bare minimum. You know, yeah. we have to do this or we're not going to get our wa water withdrawal. <laughs> so yeah. it's going to be, yeah. okay. The, the only thing that's going to be really confusing is that, you know, um, what goes on in this blue district isn't going to really make any sense anymore because we're, we're regulating what's happening in this blue district in, in a very sort of obsolete way. And what's going to go on in the green and the gray is going to make sense and be modern and so on. And the, right. the blue is going to have to really be sort of separated. Well, um, like it. Well, right now the whole thing is take longer to study the blue and come up at the next year's town meeting with changes to that. Yeah. I think that's what Dan was saying. Yeah. I think yeah. that makes sense. Then modernize the other part of it the next round. We've yeah. got a little more time to, don't to look at it. It would be easier to do it that way, more efficient to do it that way, than to come back up and try to undo what DEP has asked things to do for the for green and gray. Yeah, well, I can already tell you, undoing what they want to do is just not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. So the only chance you got is to control it is to not to do it in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Okay, good. So that's uh, that's zoning <laughs> 101, and then <laughs> 102. <laughs> So this just gives us more flexibility than we already have anyway. No, this well, it, this makes it work. Yeah. What happens, yeah. what happens is we got caught 
with the requirement of maintaining the existing frontage requirements. Mm -hmm. And what this does is, it, because it allows us to come back up and change the underlying, the, it, it doesn't change the fronting re, frontal requirements for the zone, but it, what it does is for that application allows you to change the frontal okay. fronting requirements. Mm -hmm. So in effect, it, it's under a special permit, so you, you basically still have control over it. And it's only for mixed-use buildings. It's, it's only for the mixed-use buildings. We, and yeah. Is that only in the village overlay districts? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this would, that's the only place you have mixed-use buildings. Yep. And this is a village business overlay, which covers all yeah. the business Yeah, I spent districts. Neil and I went back and forth talking about it, and then we went through a couple of emails back and forth on it. And Neil is very comfortable with this language. Would this be, a, this is a vote, a specific separate vote as opposed to a condition of a special permit? Well, I was already asked if this would be a majority vote or a four-fifths vote, and I don't think it really makes any, a lot of difference because you've got to take a four-fifths vote on a special permit. This could be a majority vote, and then you'd have the four-fifths but wouldn't it? Majority for the I guess, but I guess what I'm saying, instead of a special vote, would it simply be another condition? Of yeah, does this only come up permit? in a special, together with a special permit? Yes. Yeah. That's, it'll only come up with that. Neil thought it was not possible to, for the planning board to entertain a um, mixed-use development if the frontage didn't comply with the zoning bylaws, And that's the way he's interpreted it. No, I interpret it that way, too. I'm just saying with this change, though, this would only come up Someone couldn't just come to us and say, we want you to waive the frontage requirement without going through a full special permit process and hearing and all of that. That's what I'm concerned about. I think there well, should be a full they, hearing process. They can already, they can actually do that on a form A, but, yeah. um, but that's not what this is about at all. I mean, this is only about this village business or district. And everything that happens within those districts is subject to a special permit process. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so for mixed use. So okay. this would only apply for mixed use. So yeah. is it a condition or not? I didn't quite hear the answer there. W is it? A no, no, it's a separate vote that you would take. It's a separate. Why? Why isn't it a condition? I'm just curious. Um, I guess because it's, you know, it's a big enough deal that there's language, um, that's kind of restricted that says the construction has to meet the requirements of the underlying zoning district. So this just gives you a way to. I mean, you can condition it if you want it. You can add this as a condition. Mm -hmm. But what this says is that right now, let's say in a business district, I think it's 60 feet. You have to have 60 feet, 60 foot frontage. Right? This would allow you to come back up and take that 60 foot requirement, reduce it to 48. Right? And and you take a vote as to allow that frontage to be reduced from 60 to 48. So that would be one vote that the board would take, and then they would take that vote and build on that to come back up and either approve or disapprove the special permit. If the special permit was approved, then that would require a super majority. Yeah, it just seems like they go hand it seems like they go hand in hand. So I would I'm just curious why they were separated. I this just seems I mean I, I guess you could say that the planning board um, can I, I mean I'm not sure how you would work this out as a condition. You're just talking about an underlying aspect of the lot. Yeah. But I think you're dealing with doesn't have the right frontage. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I don't know what, how you would, like, why you would think of a condition. You could condition the special permit on a positive vote on this, on this issue. Yeah, right. but I think I, what it does yeah. is it forces you to recognize the fact that you're reducing the frontage by making the vote. Yeah, that's Requiring fine. Vote. That's fine. If everybody's happy okay. with the language. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, guess. There are not many businesses, you know, business lots that have 100 feet of frontage. Right. right. Um, and that's what you're supposed to have. So that would really be so a lot of or mixed use building. No, no, no I, I understand okay. it. I just was curious about the, I guess, mechanics per se of it. Okay. Uh, I mean, um, no, just I was just trying okay. to understand. Not that I'm for or against either one. Okay. <laughs> I think it works. I mean, it just applies to mixed use buildings, and it says that we have to issue a special permit for a mixed use building. So that's what was my concern. Yeah. So it'll only come up in a special permit process anyway. Agreed. So. Yeah, okay. I think it's good. I think it works. Yep. Do we need to vote on it? Oh, we can't vote until we have a public hearing. We can vote on no, it. No, oh. It's just a vote on submitting it to the selectmen. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. So we'll have a motion? Yeah, yeah, I move that we submit uh, this proposed change to Section 560.4 requirements for mixed use buildings as drafted to the selectmen for consideration. 
I second that motion. All those in consideration favor. for the town okay. fall town meeting. Uh, yes, for consideration for fall town meeting. For a future town meeting. The next town meeting, yes. <laughs> Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. <laughs> Where are we? Accounting, <laughs> minutes, town planner report, adjournment. Yeah, I vote for the latter. <laughs> I think I've heard Bob would make his motion. <laughs> He's trying. We're not He's there yet. <laughs> <coughs> and are these all the, s the same? Thing? Did you miss this while you were gone? I did. Oh, okay. I was wondering what you guys were doing when I was gone, so actually. Oh, we will, we'll we never know. Yeah, well, I see that. Mani we've managed to undo both of them and we'll, and when we'll you never came tell back. I see that. Especially <laughs> that 20 story high rise go up on three hours. Something happened. Right? <laughs> So I move that we approve $6.92 uh, to W.B. Mason for office supplies and folders, file folders. Uh, second. Yeah. Oh, you want to do it all? Do them all. So I always do that. Okay. Uh, also, I move $172 to pay $172.50 for uh, to Chessia Consulting for peer review services uh, for Chessia Consulting. Uh, prepare estimates for planning board for the Walnut Tree Hill collection and the performance bond. So those two. Do I have a second? Second. second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 I don't have a pen, but I... <coughs> oh, that's my stylus. You've got a pen. You can use... um, maybe I can do a real quick uh, planner report. Sure. Um, the Housing Authority is uh, redoing their parking lot. They're adding, I didn't count them, but it looks like about 25 parking spaces and they're building some type of garage um, maintenance building in the, in the backyard of the of Central Park. Um, it's an area where you have the uh, Lawson Tower, you've got you know, all sorts the of- The library is there. Street yeah. Walls, yeah. Uh, and so on. Um, so, first of all, they they didn't realize that they need a site plan review, but they are going to be coming in for a site plan review. And um, secondly, talking to Neil about this, he was thinking that perhaps they really should go to the design review because of that location. Absolutely. It's kind of like a prime landscape. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so mm -hmm. okay, yep. good, good, um, good. And um, hopefully now they understand that anytime they start to build something, they can't just like get the bulldozer out there, that they really have to talk to them first. So, um, and then that Permit Extension Act that we had um, some dealings with that extended permits for a couple of right, years. Right. Um, Governor Patrick just signed a new bill which extended that, so it's now going to be four years. And it's for any permits from 2008 mm. to 2012. Um, and then, um, is it, uh, well, I mean just a few quick things on the settlement agreement. Um, oh, for all the I need to walk out. Is that the last thing? Yeah, that's Oh, the last actually, thing. I had a question before that. Uh, what's the status on the Riverway? I know they were going to come in, and you would talk to them, and they were going to submit something. Are they on the agenda at some point? They are supposed to come in for the second meeting in September. Okay, that's all. Um, before we you leave, you want to approve the minutes? Yeah. So I. Let me do that. No. I. Uh, I, can, I can leave. Leave then. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a motion to approve the uh, Situate Planning Board minutes for July twelfth, twenty twelve, and the minutes for July twenty sixth, twenty twelve. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> it's not Walnut Tree Hill related. There's going to be a public meeting on the bus service um, that's being considered, which will be on August 21st. <laughs> and uh, there's a poster about it just as you come in the town hall. I'm not sure where the meeting's located, but it's a big public meeting to find out what hours people want and um, what time it should start, what time it should end, what days of the week, you know, all that stuff. Great. Great. That's it. I will recuse myself so that you can discuss Walnut Tree Hill. They recuse yourself all the way nice home. Seeing everybody. Nice to be back. Okay. Yes. Well, yeah. we're disappointed though you didn't wear your cowboy hat.
and, and your boots and spurs. The jingle jingle. Exactly. Okay, so the settlement agreement for Walnut Tree Hill is really looking like it should be ready to sign in the next couple of weeks. I'm, I'm really hoping. We've had a lot of back and forth. The um, insurance company has selected a contractor, so you know, that's a good thing. Um, we have this thing in what I think is its final form. It's just being, you know, I's are being dotted and T's are being crossed, as far as I know. That's, you know, that's what's happening. Good. <laughs> do I have a motion from Bob? You do, sir. I do I have a second on Bob's motion? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. <laughs>